How's it going? All right, so I've got 6 o'clock at 6 o'clock. I call this meeting in Saginaw City Council to order. Please rise for the pledges. All right, item number two is the invocation for that. Pastor Dennis Hudson. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, this evening we come uh, thankful for the day you've given us, thankful for the beautiful sky you painted earlier, reminding us of the beauty of all of your creation. Lord, we thank you that we can gather and do things that are important, not just to us, Father, but to you as well. Especially excited, the Father, this evening that there are volunteers that are going to be honored. It is nice to know that uh, people will give selflessly, not just to, to the city, but to other things. And we thank you that you lay that in our hearts, Father, because that makes us like you. Because you give to us all the time. And Father, I just ask that you would bless this assembly this evening. That uh, not only will great things happen for this city, but great things will happen to remind people that we are a family, a community together that needs you more than anything. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, sir. Hello. Item number three, it's audience participation uh, that is covered on the screen. If you wish to speak about an item, see the secretary and fill out a form just like this. You can speak on any item that is listed. Uh, we have one item that is a, a public hearing, and that will, you can speak any time on that. Yes, sir. All right, moving forward, item number four is the consent agenda. A is action, oh, I've had a request to pull items uh, F and G. F and G, so I will go to the others. A is action regarding minutes of November 19th. B is action regarding illegal agreement with Fort Worth Transportation Authority. Uh, C is action regarding approval of ordinance 2021-29, uh, amendment to the fee schedule for the pavilion. D is action regarding approval of the individual project order with Kimley Horner Associates for risk and resiliency study. Uh, e is action regarding approval of change order number three to Saginaw Boulevard 16 inch water line. Skipping down to H, action regarding replacement doors and frames at Aquatic Center. So I'll entertain a motion or any questions on A, B, C, D, E, and H. If not, I will entertain a motion on just those. Mayor, I make a motion to approve consent agenda with the exception of F and G. And I'll second that. Mr. Tucker, second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed, let the record reflect we do have a quorum this evening. Uh, only Mr. Beasley is absent. All right, so going to first item number F. And excuse me while I pull this up. Uh, F is action regarding annual contract approval renewal with Tarrant County Emergency Services District. And that is Fire Chief Doug Spears. Thank you, Mayor, Council. This is renewal of a contract we've had in my tenure, 26 years, we've always contracted with the ESD to cover a portion of the unincorporated areas in the county. We provide fire and EMS rescue service out there just like we run it in our city. And in return, they provide uh, funding for us to do that or they pay us essentially to do that. So all the unincorporated areas of Tarrant County, there's multiple departments that cover that. Our area is designated in a map that was in your packet primarily up Bonds Ranch and some areas down Old Decatur. So this year had about a 5% uh, cost increase or reimbursement increase for us. So $102,000 is what we get reimbursed. We run anywhere, it varies widely from year to year depending on grass fire season and that, but we run anywhere from 40 to 100 calls in those areas. That's both mutual aid and the areas that we cover. So for 40 to 100 calls, that's what they reimburse us with is 102,000. They also provide us with the 
water tanker that's at station two, that's our reserve apparatus, our secondary apparatus over there. It carries 2,000 gallons of water. That's our primary response apparatus in the unincorporated areas. <clears throat> I'll answer any questions you might have. Question for the chief? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. That's very informative. Um, I was just kind of curious since we've gone into an agreement with Fort Worth um, with emergency management, uh, how does this differ? Um, is it just because of the jurisdiction, because it's Tarrant County? So for emergency management, our uh, interlocal agreement is with the city of Lake Worth. For Fort Worth, we're in an agreement with the dispatch. Mm -hmm. So they handle all of our fire and EMS dispatching. Okay. So this contract is specifically for fire department response out into the county. Okay. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm real happy that we're getting reimbursed for this, but uh, I, I was just a little unclear on how all those parts fit together. We do. We have multiple interlocal agreements. It's really how the fire service survives. We can't handle every situation. Uh, so we get help and we give help in return, and we do that through this kind of instrument. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, any other questions on item F? If not, I'll entertain a motion for F. For F. Mayor, May I move that we approve the annual contact approval renewal with Tarrant County Emergency Service District 1. Is that a second? second. Mayor Pro Tem second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Moving to uh, 4G. Action regarding approval of contract with Burleson Trucking LP for demolition and haul off structure 345. North Saginaw Boulevard. Is that is that you, Rick, or is that Larry? Mr. Little. <coughs> so obviously, this is an action regarding the demolition of the mm -hmm. 345 North Saginaw Boulevard. Uh, looks like we're to schedule for. I just learned a while ago that Monday would be the scheduling date. Uh, that is the, we accept a contract for the Burleson demolition. We've had three bids on that. That is the cheapest of the bids. I just have one question. Sure. Uh, the family requested that it could be done on a Friday so they didn't put out the business because the water main, was that not a, pro was that a possibility that they could do it on a Friday so they can replumb it to the hills paint and body because it's gonna shut their water off? Yeah, I could. I don't. I don't see a problem. I, I can talk to Bur uh, Monty with Burleson okay. if you approve this, and I, I think he would be more than willing to work with us on that. It would just keep the hills. Yes, body we from we going found out that there is an issue with the water yes, that it, yes. it uh, okay. feeds both buildings. So yes, I would. Okay. Yeah, I don't see that being an issue at all. Okay, thank you, sir. As a matter of fact, we can make that happen. Thank you. Other questions for Larry? Yeah, I got yes, one. Sir. Larry, you need to refresh my memory. What did we spend roughly to for the asbestos abatement? Total cost for the asbestos, um, well, there will still be a final bill, so I don't have the total cost yet. The state, once it goes to the landfill, the state assesses a fee. Mm -hmm. Do not know what that is. That report has not hit me yet. It, so I do not have that information on what the total is going to be yet. What have we spent so far? Uh, it was like 6000 I believe. I wasn't prepared for that right there. Okay. Uh, the asbestos. Uh, I'm thinking of the contract. Fourteen thousand. Fourteen. Okay. Yeah. So we had fourteen K in asbestos abatement. We'll have more from the city refuge center, I guess is what you want to call it. Uh, Fort Worth. It, it'll be a landfill. The, yeah, the, landfill. Yes, yes, that is their fee. It's kind of like a permanent storage fee. It's uh, from what I've been told, it's minimal. It's just a fee that they have. So. And then we're looking at paying nine thousand dollars more to tear it down. Yes, sir. And I guess I got the same question I had last time we talked about this. Where do we get our money back out of this? Well, when the land eventually develops, obviously there's going to be taxables to that. So that's where you're going to see the return. Uh, and how is that property zoned right now? Yeah. I'm sorry, Sandy. How is that property zoned? So commercial. It is commercial. It is. <laughs> yeah, if, I, if, if memory serves me right, we talked about this last time, and the overall ROM, our rough order of magnitude, was 
uh, estimate it was it was end up the time is all said and done been twenty five twenty five to thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. And then they had nine more to it. Well, no, that's, no. Calculated. that's total. So. So Larry's <clears throat> about on what he thought last time. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I don't know that I really would like to see us put a lien on that property so we can at least make, get our money back out of it. <clears throat> but it is on the boulevard, so it's prime real estate. Uh, I don't know. I just don't feel like it's in the best interest of the taxpayers to foot the bill for all this, and then we don't get anything back out of it. Gabe, you want to discuss what we talked about with the, the landowner? Yeah, I think the uh, past practice with a couple of facilities that were uh, demolitions where the owner release is, uh, to your point, the demolition cost can be substantial. The abatement for asbestos is costly, but the council in the past has chosen not to assess a lien to encourage a future redevelopment. So. Larry mentioned, you know, the return comes when the property owner sells the property and it redevelops. So, and also in this case, we we discussed, if, if I'm correct, we discussed with the landowner, and they, they agreed not to really fight this this abatement if we would not put a lien on it. So, that's correct. yeah, that's, every, everybody that's acknowledged correct. it was an unsafe building and right. it was yep. going to come down at some point. Yep. We we talked about this, and what it really came down to is it's very rare that people just turn it over and let us do that. If they fight it, the amount of money we will spend in lawyer fees, for, from my understanding, would it would end up being a wash. We, we could actually be going the whole. Well, and Larry, Larry's time and his Larry's people's time as well would be significant. You're right. right. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those. <laughs> the last time we here, we talked about this. This was a hard pill to swallow. Mm. It was the best of two bad options. Is the way I look. And long term, it is betterment for the city and the, the, the appearance and the look of the, the boulevard and redevelopment as well. That's really why. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other legal way of doing it. I mean, you can't you either put a lien on the property or you can, I guess, write something legal, have them sign it and have them give us our money back that way just between us girls. Okay. But is that really the best way to do it? Right. And, and you and I spoke just prior to the meeting, and I really think our best legal strategy, if we want our money back, if that's the goal, then we need to pursue filing the lien because otherwise you just have a personal contract with someone that may or may not be judgment-proof, <coughs> may or may not be willing to honor the agreement. And if it's not honored, rather than the easier path of foreclosure, all we have available to us is filing suit in district court, for instance, and incurring all of the attorney's fees that are associated with that process. Any other questions for Larry? I don't want to make you stand up here all night, brother. How much property are we talking about? Total? Well, Total. it's connected to the other side. <coughs> One point, almost less than, less than two acres. Just a but it will be sold as the, the total thing? or That is up to the family. I wouldn't. I, yeah. it, could, it, it could be, but it, yeah. yeah. Is it platted as a single property? It is platted as a single property, yes. So they would have to come to us to it. split yes. that? Yes. So at the moment, if they sold it, they would have to sell it Unless as the less than two acres. And I will say, I just just so <coughs> the record that the family has been real cooperative with us, which and the mayor mm -hmm. was mentioned. There's a lot of time spent on this, and if we choose to go that other route, then it changes the whole format of what we've got to do. So I just want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions for okay. Mr. Little? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Larry. Any other questions, comments on this issue? If not, I'll entertain a motion for 4G. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve the contract with Burleson Trucking for the demolition of 345 North Saginaw Boulevard. Okay. So second. Cindy, second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Those passed. Thank you, guys. <coughs> Thank you, Larry. Moving forward, item number five. We've got our quilters, I think. That's five, right? Regent of, of the Thursday Saginaw Quilters Group. So y'all going to have a presentation? I'm interested to see what we got to, to talk about. And, and what we got show and tell. Awesome. Yes, we got show and tell. <laughs> uh, I'm Kay Lotz. I'm the present uh, 
I'm, I'm the <coughs> current uh, president of the Saginaw Thursday Quilters. We meet on Thursday at the community center on Park Center Boulevard. And um, we hand quilt um, beautiful quilts. And the city came to us and asked us if we would be willing to make a quilt for the sister cities. And so we grabbed it up and ran with it. And we would like to show you this today. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> it's beautiful. I yes, agree. Here, here. Yes, you did. We're so, we're so really, really so proud of this quilt. I don't know what you mean. The quilt looks really good, Charlie. I trust. Thank you so much. And the back of the quilt is just as impressive as the front. Yes, it's beautiful. And this was displayed at the Saginaw Train and Grain. Y'all had a booth, and this was displayed prominently. Yes, we did. And, um, and we had so many uh, positive comments mm -hmm. on it. Oh, yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Where was Brandon? 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 And so whenever our Gambian friends can travel, we'll present this to them. Whenever that may be, uh, we will present this to them. So. And so does this mean we get to get more special things if we need them? <laughs> we could get more special quilts if we need them. <laughs> yeah, she said yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, you should be. Here, here. That's Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> And I want you to understand that all of the lettering on the front of this quilt was cut out by hand and, and, and stitched on. So the lettering is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Thank you all very much.
Uh, number I six, recognition uh, of. Mayor, oh, I'm sorry. Cindy, I'm ahead. sorry about that. I think uh, Kelly had something else she wanted to ask <laughs> about the quilters group. Okay, so she had mentioned that she wanted to. Uh, we've had a club member or a visitor come in who was not able to find the quilters group, and nobody at the city knew they were there. No one at the rec center knew who to contact, oh. and they were wondering how to remedy that problem. Okay. So we would be easier to that find. Would be that way. And, I'll, and Kelly, <laughs> I'll let right. you finish if you. I bet they can take care of that for you. I bet they can take care of that for you. That's a good idea. That's a great I, idea. Yes. We I'm want them to be able to find you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Mayor, I, I might mention they have snacks around 11 a.m., which is when I drop by. So, And it's always good. <laughs> he knows where all the snacks are. <laughs> Ten. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> he knows where all the snacks are. We know this. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Item number six, recognition of Volunteer of the Year and Volunteer of Family of the Year for Cycle Animal Services. I think that is Jose. Mr. Mayor, member of the councils, thanks for uh, letting us come in tonight and do our recognition for our Volunteers of the Year. Um, about three or four years ago, whenever... Keith took over. Uh, he decided that I needed a new project and I was voluntold to recreate our volunteer program. So a lot of going to other cities, seeing how they do things with their volunteers, coming up with their programs and everything, uh, we decided to go ahead and put one into place that actually worked. Um, so I've been in charge of this going on probably about four years now, doing the volunteer program. Uh, before I came in tonight, I looked up our volunteer hours that were put in last year for the fiscal year, and from October 1st of 2020 to September 31st, 2021, our volunteers put in 1,746 hours. That is a lot of help to the shelter. That is. that is a lot of people coming in, taking time out of their days and out of their families' lives to come in and help us with the animals, clean the shelter, take the animals for walks, uh, after, or off site adoption events, kind of like training grain, Taste of Northwest, events like that. So in about three years ago, we decided to come up with a volunteer of the year and a volunteer family of the year award to show special recognition to certain volunteers that stand out amongst all of them. Um, this year from October 1st, 2021 to September 21st, or sorry, October 1st, 2020 to September 1st, 31st of 2021, we recognized Olga Vasilieva as our Volunteer of the Year. She started out um, in June of 2021 during the summer school break. Uh, she is a senior at Saginaw High School, and from June 1st until the end of the fiscal year, she completed 215 and a half hours of volunteer work at the shelter. Amazing. So I'd like to award her with a special plaque or a special uh, award from the shelter. So Olga, if you'll go ahead and come up. <clears throat> I didn't bring my glasses with me, so bear with me for a minute. <laughs> It says 2021 Volunteer of the Year is presented to Olga Vasilieva. Um, and then the smaller writing, I can't read too good because, like I said, I didn't bring my glasses. Anyways, this award is presented to you on behalf of the staff from the Animal Shelter. They're all here tonight to present this with us. 
So my staff will come up here so we can get a picture. Yeah, let us get out of the way. Mr. Mayor, would you like to come up here and join us? If you'd us? like me to, sure. So I do have one more award to present. It's Volunteer Family of the Year. Um, I do not believe that they showed up tonight due to scheduling conflicts, but the Spencer family sponsored numerous cats and adoption fees for the animals at our shelter um, to help with them getting adopted out. Um, they've also purchased materials such as poop scoops for the shelter, cat litter when we get low on cat litter, and other materials to assist with caring for the animals, and also volunteered following the following amount of hours. Um, there are four family members in the Spencer family. Um, if you're not aware, the Spencer family was volunteer of the year last year also. Um, Elsa put in 225 and a half hours from October 1st to September 31st. Sean put in 235.25 hours. Nathaniel did 231.25 and Kobe did 212.75 hours for a total of 904 hours, 904.75 hours. They come in every Saturday. They do not miss a lick. Wow. So they come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they usually stay until we shut down or until about noon. So I have their award here. They're not here tonight, like I said, due to uh, scheduling conflict, so we'll give this to them the next time they come in. Tell them we said thank you. We will. Thank you, Jose. No problem. Appreciate it. Well done, guys. Item number seven, item number seven consideration action regarding resolution number 2021-28 naming of the Bailey Boswell Road overpass. It says Gabe Rayoon, but I think it's me actually, right, Gabe? I think it is me. Yeah. So, it says Tom. Uh, so this is uh, the overpass, and this has been a, a big project, that's been ongoing for many, many, many years. This road was was first discussed in about 2000, maybe 2001. Uh, we've got information and emails going back. A long time. Um, so it's been in, in the works in one way or the other through different designs, different locations, different iterations. Uh, it was passed in 2012. The bond was 2012? 13. 13. I, I'm jumped at 2013. So several years. We built the, the um, Bailey Boswell, the road first, starting from the east, going back to the west. Finished up with the bridge. Uh, some delays with the bridge. Many things have gone on. It's almost done. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, we will probably complete and uh, do a grand opening sometime in January. That's about where we are, so we're really, very close. A uh, huge project, many millions of dollars, but uh, we discussed what to do about this. Uh, when we were first talking about this bridge, uh, County Commissioner J.D. Johnson stepped up and said, I will donate money out of the discretionary commissioner's fund for the bridge. Initially, it was $4 million. Great. Uh, going through this project, as the years stepped on, uh, the price went up. Price of concrete went up, price of steel went up, et cetera. So we went back to the commissioner. He gave us more money. Uh, he ended up giving six and a half, six and a half total. And that's not his money. It's the county's money, but it's discretionary per the commissioner. So, uh, and, and that's when we, we brought this to the council. I said, you know, bridges are on sale right now. Uh, the county commissioner has graciously uh, offered to give this. But it's more than that for, with J.D. Um, if you don't know Commissioner Johnson, um, I will read uh, the resolution. I'll read some of his bio as well, so bear with me for just a moment. So, yeah, oh, it said, the resolution said 2013. I didn't read that. So, uh, so where is um, the City Council and City of Saginaw wishes to recognize the service of Commissioner J.D. Johnson, who served as a member of the Saginaw City Council from 1963 to 1965 and from 1979 to 1980 and is mayor of the city of Saginaw from 1980 to 1986, and is Tarrant County Commissioner for Precinct 4 from 1986 until today. Whereas Commissioner Johnson, in six decades of dedicated service to the citizens of Saginaw and Northwest Tarrant County, has supported law enforcement, the criminal justice system, homeland security, promoted agricultural education, 4-H and FFA activities, 
use scholarship funding, enhance the delivery of community, community services by addressing health care for indigents, drug abuse prevention, road maintenance, and gaining respect throughout the state for his staunch physical conservatism, his focus on the accountability of taxpayers, and his leadership in efficiency, efficiently providing high-quality services to the citizens of Saginaw and Tarrant County. Whereas Commissioner Johnson displays outstanding commitment to the citizens of Saginaw and Tarrant County by actively supporting many community organizations, including the Saginaw Chamber of Commerce, the Stockyards Business Association, Tarrant County Junior Livestock Show Association, and the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo. Whereas the City of Saginaw and the City, of, the City Council and the City of Saginaw now desires to honor Commissioner J.D. Johnson for his years of service by designating the bridge located at the inter intersection of Bailey Boswell Road and North Saginaw Boulevard as the Commissioner J.D. Johnson Bridge. So this is in recognition of many, many years of service um, to the county, but also to us. Um, truthfully, J.D. is very good to us, uh, to the city of Saginaw. Anything we need, we get from J.D. He is, I don't want to say he's preferential to Saginaw, but he's very gracious to Saginaw. He and his whole staff have been wonderful to us. So, uh, and you can see many, he's been commissioner since 1986. That's a long time. And he's done good work. He's retiring, I believe, next year, a uh, year from now. So in recognition of that, that's why we wanted to do this. Um, I brought this to the, to the council saying this is something I'd like to do. We don't name a lot of stuff in Saginaw. We have not. Um, this is a sort of a special case. Uh, so we're talking about some kind of a plaque, some kind of a something like that for, for Commissioner Johnson. So that's, that's the history behind this, and, and uh, I appreciate you all indulging me. Let me read such a, a rather long resolution. Uh, I've spoken enough. Any other council members want to say anything? Uh, any other comments, questions from the council? I think he deserves it. Yes, Cindy. I, uh, I have one comment. I, I agree with you that Commissioner Johnson has been great for Saginaw. Uh, and as your resolution noted, you know, he, he was not just a commissioner. Mm. He was the mayor of Saginaw. He was a, a citizen of Saginaw. Uh, he's been very active in several things. And I would hate to just kind of corner him by calling it the Commissioner J.D. Johnson Bridge. Mm -hmm. If we could might maybe consider just the J.D. Johnson Bridge because then... Uh, I guess the reason you thought that because that's sort of his title now, that's his retiring title, but I don't know. I'm open for whatever we think would be appropriate. It's just a recommendation. No, it's a good, it's a, yes, Mary. Um, <clears throat> I thought of that too, but then I thought of it again. Okay. <laughs> and I thought, well, years from now, no one might know what his title was. And, you know, I think it is appropriate to call it the commissioner. Yeah, I mean, you can't put all of his titles no, on there, but that's his latest true. title, mm -hmm. and it's a very important title. And so I think it would be good to put that. You know, that, that's a good, you're a good point, though. Maybe we could put on a plaque, Commissioner J. Dustin Bridge, but below the plaque, just put a brief bio with yeah. saying that he was Mayor of Saginaw. He's a yeah, long time great. residence, long time benefactor, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. Would that be? I think, I think that's so. a, good, a good idea, though. Yeah, because I'm not sure Google his, will be around by then. <laughs> yeah, you might add that he had his own domino room in the. No, okay. that's, you're right. Very important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you know, domino player yeah. Johnson. I think to this day he's still talking about that and would want to play. Oh, wow. I, feel the, I feel the need to chime in <clears throat> because we are uh, working, of course, to try to, to get the plaque fabricated okay. out of Pennsylvania. And so the way the plaque currently reads is that it's a, the J.D. Johnson bridge, but underneath his relief, there will be a relief picture of him will be raised. We have Commissioner J.D. Johnson. Okay. And then a text that says, you know, for the grateful for the city citizens of Saginaw. Okay. So right. I, I, simple, but I mean, at least it gets the commissioner in and it mm -hmm. also okay. shortens the title of the bridge. Are you putting it on both ends of the bridge or how are you going to do that? Uh, the, there is a, those, the Texas insets that are in the MSC walls, the walls of the bridge. Uh -huh. There's, you see the Texas emblems that are inset. Okay. The, the plaque will actually be inset in, in the one that's across from Albertson's. Okay. So on the south side, that's the plan. If we can find a way to mount it where someone won't steal it, but anyway, <laughs> that's a technical matter. Sure. But uh, no, thank you, Rick. That's, and y'all have already sort of thought of some of our concerns. That's that's excellent. Appreciate that. Any other questions or comments, Council? If not, I will entertain a motion for this resolution. Mayor, I make a motion that we accept the action regarding resolution twenty twenty one dash twenty nine. No, that's the wrong one. Excuse me. 2021-28, named in Bailey Boswell Road overpass, J.D. Johnson Bridge. So a second. All in favor, favor, raise your right hand. Excellent. Thank you, guys.
Well deserved to, to the commissioner. Yes. I've reached out to his uh, his family as well to let them know this is going to happen. That we were looking at this, and I even sent the resolution to his son uh, just to proofread it. So they will probably be in if pending weather. Commissioner Johnson will be at the, uh, the grand opening uh, if the all possible. He probably his, will. His be. health and the weather. So yeah. thank y'all. Uh, moving forward, item number item number eight: consideration action regarding resolution 2021-29 election of members to the Board of Directors of the Tarrant Appraisal District. For that, City Manager Gabe Raymond. Mayor and Council, as you're aware, the Tarrant Appraisal District uh, establishes fair market values for uh, taxable purposes in the county. Um, this is an item that's purely at your discretion. I have no presentation or information uh, as to who you would like to support uh, as members to join the Board of Directors. I believe Janice uh, sent you all a link with some um, information about each of the candidates. And again, it's a discretionary item. Staff has no information or recommendation. You can choose as you see fit. And we have how many votes? We have 10 votes. We can put them all in one candidate or different candidates as we see fit, right? That's what we've done in the past. I do have one request to speak on this, so I'll let him go. Mr. Lasada, would you like to approach? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Gary Lasada, and I reside at 802 Dove Creek Trail, South Lake, Texas. I am currently a member of the Tarrant Appraisal District Board of uh, Directors. Two years ago, this council uh, cast all of your votes in my favor. Uh, this is sort of a unique thing for me to get to speak like this because I want to tell you what's going on. You don't see us very often, but it's a little hard for us to go to 70 something entities, but I've already been to quite a few this year. When I first went to my first meeting two years ago and I walked in, I was a little stunned. There was no Texas flag, there was no United States flag, there was no invocation and there was no Pledge of Allegiance. By the second meeting, I can assure you all of that took place. Now, I don't want to take all the credit for that because that would be disingenuous at best. Uh, there were other board members that felt the same way. So. Heading in that direction, I wanted to let you know that there has been some things that uh, have changed at uh, the appraisal district. Uh, I think for the good. I think we've become more transparent as a governmental agency. Um, I am around the cities. I am around the school districts. I do return telephone calls. And on top of that, uh, we now publish our agenda and our board packet in advance of meetings. That wasn't done before. We also uh, now broadcast live, so you can hear our meetings and you don't have to go around and figure out what did they say, who did what. Uh, that's uh, readily available, and it's uh, available for the recording portion of that within 24 hours. So if you did miss hearing it live, you still can hear it right after that. A uh, Couple of other things I wanna share with you as, as to what's happened. The end of 2019, there was $825,000 in res residual funds from our budget. Rather than rolling it back into our budget, we returned that to all of the entities. At the end of 2020, we had a re residual of $1,250,000. And again, rather rolling that into our budget, we returned that to the entities. So we're trying to be good stewards of the public's uh, uh, money. In June of 2021, this year, we had our first comprehensive uh, budget workshop that we can find on record. It may have taken place some years ago. But as you know, as elected officials, it's very difficult to approve a budget if you don't know what's in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we uh, opened that up to the public. We spent several hours discussing, and uh, it eventually came to you for your information and approval, uh, and it is now in place for 2022. We also did something uh, a little unique, and I don't know why this is unique, but we did do this. Uh, we made sure that all billing agreements and contracts in excess of $50,000 came before our board for approval before issuance. The reason why that happened was that we discovered that an individual was being paid 37000 over $37,000 a month with no contract, with no billing agreement, with no sign-off, with our board. That will not happen again. 
I could go on and on and on, and I, I don't want to really bore you with a whole lot of things. I just want to let you know, in addition to uh, uh, us being becoming more transparent, we also are holding the staff accountable to what's going on because it's important, again, like I said earlier, to be uh, good stewards. Now, I'm going to tell you just, just quickly just about me, and then I'll, I'll hush up because I know you have a lot of other things to do, and I'm also losing my voice because I've been speaking out on the circuit for about two months. Um, I have uh, held positions as assistant to the city manager, as assistant to the superintendent of schools, as director uh, of administration for Dallas Area Rapid Transit. I'm very familiar as to what goes on in the public sector and how it should go. I have a master's degree from Stanford. Um, not that that's necessarily the greatest thing in the world, but it was fun for me. And, and it brings me into a thinking process that I didn't have prior to that. I also want you to know that uh, over the years, um, I had my own companies and did business with school districts, with cities, and, and the like. Well, I guess that's probably enough about me and that's enough about this. Uh, I will say one thing that's important. If, even if you do not give me all of your votes, that's, and that would be desirable, I would like to point something out to the staff because I think they need to know this. The correspondence that they have been receiving from the appraisal district and the chief appraiser says that uh, the, the vote count and the resolution that needs to be in their possession uh, before the 15th. Well, most folks interpret that at, as on or before. That's not the way it's been interpreted. It means before the 15th. So that means really the 14th, which should have been stated that way to start with. And I apologize for that getting out that way. I've had that conversation with the chief appraiser already. So it's very important that whatever you do tonight gets to the chief appraiser by the 14th of December of this year, or it will not be counted. One city has already been um, disqualified uh, for the nomination process because they got their nomination resolution and, and, and names of nominees in on the 15th and they were denied uh, that resolution. So I, that's just an, a word of encouragement to staff to be aware of that and that's all I have to say. The other thing is by this opportunity, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Lasada. Again, anyone else wishes to speak on this, please uh, you can fill out a form, you can just come and speak. Uh, council, any questions? Yes, Mary. Oh, do you mind coming back up? <laughs> so I may have missed this in all the background information that we read, but how many members are on the board? That's a great question. There are five. Five, five elected members. The uh, county tax assessor collector uh, serves in a non-voting capacity. And then does one person's position come up for renewal each year, only one position? No, all five positions come up every two years. Every two years. And okay. this year, an added thing that has occurred, which is, I think, fantastic, that term limits have been instituted by the uh, uh, state legislature, and the uh, term limits are now, you cannot serve more than five two-year terms, so basically 10 years max, uh, and I think that's healthy. I think that's very good for this particular organization to... Uh, uh, turnover periodically. And how many terms have you served? This is, I'm just completing my first term. Your first term, but uh, you're the the head of the board of directors? Oh, no, no, no. I'm okay, just a board I thought member. I heard you say that. No, no. I thought that would be unusual. No, I'm the just a board <laughs> member. I, what I didn't tell you, and I, since you brought that up, I was chair of the uh, appraisal review board committees for six years and may have had some of you in one of my panels. I don't know. Uh, I don't see any pitchforks coming at me, so maybe <laughs> not. But uh, I did that for six years, and that's an, another unique qualification, completely different than the board of directors for the appraisal district. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yes, and I did. I do have some comments, and thank you. Thank you for answering the questions. Yeah. Anybody uh, else before I sit? Mm -hmm. Oh okay. yes, I'm no, sorry. No, I need the exercise. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. I, I'm sorry. I do oh. have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was watching the interview of one of your um, the other candidates, and I noticed that he had a chart that showed how Tarrant County's, uh, I guess we have the highest number or one of the highest number of uh, protests. And I mean, it's 
considerably higher than uh, the other 253 counties in the state of Texas. Um, what's the plan to try to control that? I know personally, you know, I was shocked when I opened up the little blue letter one day and it's like, oh, your taxes have increased 87% over the last five years. Um, are we going to try to slow that down, these increases? That, that's a great question. It's a very astute question, by the way. Uh, and that person's name was Rich Dion, by yes. the way. And Rich and I have worked tirelessly together over these last two years. We're not in competition at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on the same page. He brought that uh, chart forward, and he actually brought it in front of the subcommittee to Senator Nelson down in Austin, presented that to her. Uh, with that, uh, we, Rich and I were voted down three to two to try to get an audit done just on that question as to why this was happening. We know why it's happening, but there are other folks that don't want that audit and don't want us to bring that to a head. So if Rich and I both get elected, and that's not saying that, you know, I want to split votes with Rich, but if you choose that way, that's fine. But we're going to try again this uh, next term because uh, there needs to be a resolution to that. Uh, primarily was related to software. I think, Mayor Flippo, you might have been, you've heard some things about that. Mm -hmm. But it was a software conversion that was a problem. And to the, today is still a problem, but not nearly as bad. Okay. So, and again, you know, I'm not trying to take votes away from you, but is it better to have two of you on the same side on this board? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, <laughs> let me say this. You split votes, you dilute the process. And that's what happens. Now, if that's, if that's your pleasure, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't be offended by it whatsoever. But typically, it's, it, it's better that if you have an individual that you know, that you've worked with, um, to get, give all of the votes to that person. Because remember, you have all these other entities that are stacking the deck. It's not a better way for me to say that. And I you know that's controversial, but it's true. When you get 600 vote blocks like you do out of Fort Worth, you know, they get who they want. And so uh, Mr. Dion, and I don't want to speak for Mr. Dion because that's a dangerous thing to do, but uh, we're, we're in tandem with one another. Uh, he has his path to victory. I have mine pretty much sealed. But if we start splitting him with him or with me, then that could weaken our position and we may not get reelected. Mm -hmm. So... That's, that's at your pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'll try sitting down. Okay. <laughs> all right, Mary, you had something you wanted to discuss? Uh, first of all, I wanted to say with us just having 10 votes, if we can agree on one candidate, that would be good to give one person all 10 votes. It will be more effective. Um, second. This is the first year I've, I've lived in my house. I had it built. And this year, this past year, was the first year that we I invested in my wife's university, ours. And what was interesting is the three houses beside me, my house and my two neighbors, was all built at the exact same time within six months. It's built by policy. They're the exact same house other than the brick and stuff. Until 2016, there wasn't $50 difference in our taxes. Now there's $50,000. And the only difference is, not personal, but I wasn't smart enough to go down there and contest it every year. My neighbor lives to the right of me. He goes down there like a pit bull every year. He gets $50,000 knocked off. Uh, something has got to change. So, I mean, if, from what, you, what I've heard, uh, that's what you're trying to do. So, I'm Mary, go ahead. And I really appreciate the fact that we got so much more information this year than we ever have had. In the past, we've, we've not known anything about these candidates. One time, one of our council members knew one candidate, and, you know, I think you, you mentioned you had come before us. And that's the, since I've been on city council, which was 2017, that's the first time a candidate ever came. So I was impressed with that. Now, one of these 11 candidates happens to be a person that I have worked with professionally and 
have very high regard for. And I was prepared to come and speak on his behalf. However, I really thought you made a very good speech, and I thank you. I give you points for coming and talking to us. And you're, you know, you're, you have some experience on the board itself. So I think I would like to see Mr. Lasada get our votes. Okay. Other thoughts, Council? I'm a, a data person, and I'm, I'm very, very happy that you are aligned with uh, Diot, Diotti, Diot, Diot. Um, in that respect. I did not pick that up in your interview, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, his graphic spoke volumes to me and uh, kind of made me mad, you know, when I saw it. But, uh, and again, I'm glad you're on the same page. Um, I, so, you know, I, I feel inclined to support both of you. And I'm trying to understand the split. You know, I'd rather have two people in the same mindset. Um, but I understand what you're saying as well. You know, we got a measly. 10 votes compared to 600. So I'm still kind of torn, but you know, the fact that you just showed up here tonight, again, just like the, the data speaks volumes to me and it just shows me your dedication. So thank you for showing up. Mr. Tucker, any thoughts? Mayor Pro Tem. I say give them all 10 votes. Let's give them all 10 votes. Nikki. Okay. Can do it. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, okay. And, and I, I'm fine with that as well. I, I think uh, bundling our votes together is a little more powerful than splitting them up because the, a lot of the entities have many more votes than we do. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I'll entertain a motion. Oh, unless you want to say something. I'm sorry, forgot to mention one thing. I was very impressed with all the candidates' backgrounds, and you know they they would all probably do a great job. So it was really hard to to pick a person, but the fact that you came and the fact that you've been on the board and you know how it works, and you know I really enjoyed your uh, interview that was online. I thought you did a good job. So um, I would like to have all 10 votes to Mr. Lasada. You, oh, you, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Unless then. anybody else wants to speak, then proceed with the motion. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve resolution number 2021-29, giving all 10 of our votes to Mr. Lasada. I second it. Okay. second all those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Good luck, sir. All right, item number, we're on uh, nine. So at 6.53, we're in a public hearing. Considering the action regarding an ordinance accepting the approval of the Belt Mill Public Improvement District Service and Assessment Plan and Assessment Role for Belt Mill Public Improvement District. Uh, and that Gabe Reagan? Yeah, <clears throat> Mayor and Council, just a couple notes. The developer's representative, Don Allen, is here, uh, as well as Kyle Sikorsky from P3. So I want to draw your attention to the packet. Mark McClaney, our financial advisor, included a memo. This does not affect the tax rate. The public improvement district will issue no debt. It will be uh, fund the improvements on a reimbursement basis. And with that, I will uh, turn over to Don Allen with uh, Lackland. Uh, thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Don Allen with Lackland Holdings and Belt Mill Saginaw, LLC. 
Uh, we're here tonight to hopefully kind of finish up this long series of meetings and mm -hmm. processes and steps to uh, uh, finalize the creation of the uh, Belt Mill PID within Saginaw. Um, tonight with, uh, I have our, uh, our planner and our consultant, Doug Powell and McAdams here with us. Uh, our um, legal counsel for the PID, Roxanne Sheehan of, Shoot, of the firm Shoot Ventura. And as uh, uh, earlier mentioned, uh, y'all have Kyle Siskorski with P3 Consultants, I believe, uh, who works on the city's behalf on the PID side and does all the vetting and reviewing and makes sure everything is kosher from a legal standpoint and a, and a city standpoint. So uh, we are happy to be here. Um, I did want to just very briefly go through the presentation again, just to remind you what we're here for. And I'm, I'm going to see if I can get the right button or not here. Well, that's not the right button. There we go. Uh -oh. There we go. Okay. Again, this is this is our land plan, and this is based on the the last approved zoning case at our, I believe, at the last council meeting, mm -hmm. um, which reflects our current zoning and our current plans in place. Uh, we are proceeding with the uh, construction plans. We're about to kick off construction on the residential neighborhood. One of the multifamily sites, the Grand, of Sag Grand Saginaw, is under construction. The other two sites are under contract. Um, and then the retail sites, we're working on marketing as we speak. So we are, we are moving forward, and that's not what we're here for, but just to remind you what the scope of the project is. Um, again, copy of the land plan. The only thing that may differ in there is that middle multifamily site, that middle multifamily site, they are still working on their final site plan and that may vary a little bit, but the other site plans you see on everything are, are well, on the multifamily and the residential are what you'll see there. Obviously the, the retail, once we have a retail developer, they may tweak around the exact layouts of those depending on who the users are. Um, this just concept of our landscaping, we're, you know, we're as soon as we get finished with construction, we'll start with our landscaping and our irrigation and our amenities along Belt Mill Parkway. Uh, that's just a buffer exhibit from our previous zoning case. What I, what I wanted to talk about are a couple of things, and I may go, let me see if I've got a better one here. This is a concept of what we've come up with on the, on the entry feature, and you can kind of get a scale of it when you look at the vehicles next to it. So we want something big and noticeable because we have like one main entry and we want to really kind of get a, the most bang for our buck. So that's what we're looking at as far as a concept. And of course we've got the, the, the lake that we've agreed to make all these improvements around. It'll be a wet pond. Both of our ponds will be wet ponds with fountains in them and stations around them. And we had talked about some ideas around this lake with some rest stations, benches, maybe exercise stations or educational things. And it, it I kind of, had a thought last week, and I bounced this off a couple of people. What I'd like to ask you on that is what I thought might be something that, that would be interesting and unique and rather than just some kind of educational thing about nature or whatever is if we have five or six stations around the lake with a benches and a rest place and whatever, but could we create plaques and say something, you start here and you kind of walk through maybe like a history of Saginaw, mm -hmm. the early settlement, you know, uh, early years, formation, uh, all the way up to today. I, I would need your help. I'd need somebody, mm -hmm. some local historians to help us feed us that information. And we've got to boil it down. To I volunteer Ellen Ritchie. <laughs> right. I second that volunteer. <laughs> but, you know, it has to be condensed down to the point it could be on a, on a series of five or six plaques. But... Mm -hmm. You could bring your kids out there and walk around the lake, and by the time you're done, you have a. You can show your kids, your grandkids. School, schools can take their kids down there. Would that yeah. would that be a, a better use of that than just some kind of nature educational or something like that? I'd I'd like to do it if y'all were amenable to it. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a good idea. Okay, okay, but like I say, I'll need help with the right people to get the right information there. So I'll. Uh, I'll count, and I'm sure there are people in town that mm -hmm. I, I, I that y'all have that could do that. So, so having said that, that that's really I, I, I just literally had that last week. I bounced it like I said, bounced it off a of game mm -hmm. and a couple people to be sure what you know. And and uh, sounds like y'all are all in favor of that too. So mm -hmm. I'd love to head down that road, and 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 that's that's a better 
use of those that I can think of almost anything else. So if you all be okay with that, that's kind of what I'd like to do with these stations around the lake. Old railroad cars for benches? I'm sorry? Old railroad seats for benches? I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I really don't know because we got to think about maintenance and whatever, but, but you know, we'll look at something like that, but something to kind of evoke some of that stuff. So, in, in, you know, what the style of the plaque is and all that, we can figure all that out, something that works. But if, uh, if with, with your permission, I'd like to pursue that in that path. I think everybody's in favor of that. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And, uh, and again, and I'm not going to go through the presentation again other than just kind of remind you where we are. Um, your consultants have uh, vetted all of our service and assessment plan and the levy, and, uh, there, and obviously Mr. Sikorsky is here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, but with that, if we can go this in as much or as little detail as you want. Like I say, I know you've seen it several times. You have other business to attend to. Um, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and with that, we're going to re respectfully request your final approval of the PID uh, service and assessment plan tonight. Council questions? I want to bring everybody's attention to the uh, attached uh, memo from Mark McClaney uh, from Samco Capital. I hope everybody read that. Uh, he's a our Samco Capital guy. He's also a financial advisor. Um, it's a short memo, but the very end, the last paragraph, I will read. I think it's important. He states, it is important to remember that the assessments are only paid by the people who live within the PID and not from other taxpayers. Further, all public improvements will be dedicated to the city. The city will have no financial obligation to pay for any of the construction unless the city requests oversizing. No taxes, revenue, or other funds of the city will be dedicated to this project, and nothing that the city does will constitute any obligation. The city will be reimbursed for all costs, including time of staff, staff time, and outside consultants will be paid by the developer. Finally, the PID will not hurt the city's bond rating. So that's something good to keep in mind, and that uh, the full memo, I encourage you to read it, is in our packet. So. Yes, uh, Mary, go ahead. And not being an expert on bond ratings, but I would venture to guess that it might improve our bond rating, having such a... The uh, tax showcase. base, would, I, again, I'm certainly no expert on that, but having the additional tax base in the town certainly, I think, would benefit your, your bond rating. Couldn't hurt it. <laughs> Absolutely. Sandy, you, you find your question? Okay. <laughs> Other questions, Council? Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing, so that means the public may speak. You don't have to see the city sector. You can just approach the, uh, the lectern and speak. So I will open up the floor to anyone in the audience who wishes to speak. Yes, ma'am. Now's the time. Kelly Stewart, 404 Mustang Drive. Uh, I like the idea. Um, I have been doing some research on the city of Saginaw myself, and I would like to ask the council, why is it, how did it get the name Saginaw and who named it? Actually, it came from Saginaw, Michigan. Um, it was like a sister or something city, and it was because of the railroad. The stop, they stopped. Who, Mr. Green? Mr. Green, no. Mm -hmm. Mr. Green didn't name Saginaw. No, you yeah, to go what back. I read, he did. You got to go further back. I okay. studied it in, in school. So oh, because it said he originally back. wanted it called Pontiac. Yes. And then, it, but I don't think it was Mr. Green. I can't think of the guy's really? name. Really? It wasn't Mr. Oh, Green. well, that's that's that was my research. The Greens have been here a long time, but I don't think it was Mr. Green that named it. Okay. Well, I think it was Mary Copeland's family. <laughs> 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 but anyway. You know, it is very interesting, yes. But but it is, yes. and uh, several other things in my little research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thought I thought that one was interesting. But uh, having grandkids now, I like the idea. Yeah. You know, we we've got uh, you know we're putting in parks and we're doing things for the recreational purposes, and I think that would. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's. My two cents, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the floor is still open. Anyone else wish to speak? Uh, we are still in public hearing. Yes, sir. I have to say one thing while I'm here. 
Absolutely, please. please. Uh, I just wanted to address the council. Enter and sign in, please. Your name. Kyle, Kyle Sikorsky, P3 Works, the consul city, uh, city's paid consultant. Um, I just wanted to make you aware. Um, it's been a while now since I did the PID 101, um, if you even remember me being here for that. <laughs> but uh, the city council will be acting as the de facto board for this PID, so you will be seeing us at least once a year to provide a service and assessment plan update. Um, so long as the district exists. So you'll see us, but we'll be moving into the administrative portion of this. So we'll be working very closely uh, with your city staff. Um, I say all the time, about 90% of our job is just education. So um, your future residents moving in, it's very important that they're aware of the PID and they're educated on it. So we will be working very closely with your staff, with the developer, making sure that um, the proper disclosures are given out and. Um, uh, I'll also make it aware to you if you don't already know. We have a website, p3-works.com, um, that has a searchable database. So we will upload all the official documents, the service and assessment plan to that website. And as it's platted in the future, um, residents will be able to search by their property address and see all the latest information on the PID. So that will all be available to your residents in the future. Um, but you'll be seeing me annually. Any other questions you have? From that perspective, I'm happy What's to that website well. again, please? Uh, P3-works, W-O-R-K-S dot com. Thank you. And often we'll, uh, we'll get with the city as well and have them link our website on the, the city's mm -hmm. um, website as well. Um, we're more than happy to work out any of that as well. Um, oh, again, great. just the knowledge is, is key in this business. So. That's a great idea. Any other questions for Kyle while he's up here? He's the expert. All right. Thanks, All right, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, any other questions? Any other audience questions? Uh, we are still in public hearing. And I keep saying it to remind myself so I don't forget to close it out because Bryn will uh, jab me if I don't. He has an electric buzzer he hits. Um, anything else? Then at 7.06, I take us out of a public hearing and I'll entertain a motion. Um, Mayor, I make a motion that we approve ordinance number 2021-30. Uh, that is an ordinance accepting and approving a belt mill public improvement district service and assessment plan and assessment role for the belt mill public improvement district. Cindy second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome to Saginaw. Let's do it right. Moving forward, item number 10, consideration and action regarding the First Amendment to development agreement between the City of Saginaw and Belt Mill Saginaw. With that, City Manager Gabe Ray. Mayor and <clears throat> Council, I left the graphic that uh, Don reviewed up for illustration. So you'll, uh, if you draw your attention to the southwest portion of the property, which is the lower left-hand corner, uh, we're talking about the uh, developer dedicating that parcel to the city uh, for ownership, it's about approximately 4.7 acres. Um, the return or the obligation of the city would be to construct the uh, pump station that we discussed at our last meeting, which would be an item that uh, the TERS that's been created would be a reimbursable expense. So the idea for that parcel is to have some public facility in the future, uh, 4.7 acres, and i um, happy to answer any questions you might have. No, this this land is not for the pump station. The pump station itself is what point it, two. It's just point one two. Point one, yeah, point one. It's minimal, uh, but we're agreeing to construct the pump station. We'll receive this parcel for oh, okay. public facility, public use. It's sort of a musical chairs. So, as the users uh, buy and plat the parcels, the actual boundaries change. You'll recall uh, one of the the users last meeting changed their the amenity so yeah we'll end up with that 4.7 acre parcel yes, like that, that 4.7 is for the a future city city project tbd but it will be it's owned by the city and the city can do with whatever we choose so uh, that's correct you have a question brent yes absolutely i apologize for interrupting I, I might also add you may recall the original development agreement contemplated the developer agreeing to construct the buildings in the various phases with certain 
masonry materials, um, something that we would otherwise be preempted from requiring. And in consideration for that, the city uh, initially agreed to waive the application fees for the first 10 building permits. That's now no longer going to be necessary. The agreement to construct the booster station will serve as the consideration. And so that's been removed. And so that's a, a, a benefit to the city as well. Okay. City Jeff. Yeah. I'm looking at uh, Exhibit D that came with our packet. And it's the second page, well, even the first page of Exhibit C as well. But it talks about uh, that 4.67 acres is the public natatorium. And I would like that natatorium term removed because we've not agreed to that. We've also talked about uh, like a, a community center and expanding the senior citizen center and the police substation as part of that package. So if I could address that, thank you for bringing that up. I apologize for not mentioning it. So exhibits C and D that you see in the packet really were just placeholders. Mm -hmm. um, the developer was able to work with the surveyor and provide us with meets and bounds descriptions of the two parcels. The, all references to natatorium have been removed and it just now simply says public facility site. Okay, because, um, you know, I don't want people think that, he, that this is a, a done deal because they're already saying it is and it's not and I just don't want to reinforce that so I would like that it's you said it absolutely been it's been completely removed yes. thank, you. thank you council other questions if not I'll entertain a motion Mayor, I guess we I make a motion to for the first amendment to the development agreement between the city of Saginaw and Belt Mill. Mm -hmm. As presented. Mm -hmm. Do I have a second? Mr. Tucker, second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Excellent. Thank you guys. Excellent. Item number eleven. Consider us an action regarding authorization of contract with Burn Construction Services for construction manager at, at risk services for the new library and senior center. For that, Chief of Police, Lee Howe. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, as you know, we are uh, in the process of uh, early stages of the design uh, process for the new library and senior center uh, with PGAL Architect Services. Uh, many of you uh, attended some of those stakeholder meetings, and those are, I think they're going exceptionally well. So the next major step in this was to secure a construction firm to, uh, to build the buildings. And uh, we put out RFPs on that back in October. We had four very qualified firms respond to those to those uh, to that RFP, and that was Burn Construction Services, Balfour Beatty, Sidalco Construction Services, and Steel Freeman. Um, a selection committee consisting of Ellen Ritchie, Keith Reinhardt, Rick Russell, Rick Trice, and myself reviewed all of those proposals and portfolios, and we conducted an interview. Um, process and uh, the committee unanimously uh, determined that uh, burn construction was uh, the most qualified to uh, offer a contract uh, to uh, construct our library and senior center so it's the recommendation of the committee that um, we have a contract with the, or we offer them a contract the there's three documents that were supposed to be in your packet um, and I apologize one of those didn't load properly so that's why we gave you a paper copy of the third one those are the three construction main uh, construction contracts and we do have two members of uh, burn construction with us here um, uh, Jason Moore and Lee Howell and yes he has the same names I do but we're not related <laughs> just um, ma'am and that, no, it, no, because he's younger, smarter, and better looking, and I, I'm going to be showing up the whole time. So, no, I, but um, no, they, uh, they're here to answer any questions that you, uh, that you might have, um, and I'll, or I will try to, uh, to answer any that you might have. Council, questions? Questions, concerns, issues, anything? I 
I do have a question, just a general question. Sure. So what does the future look like? You know, I've been hearing people who've had homes built that are not able to get doors and windows, materials are difficult to find. Uh, what can we expect as far as um, our building schedule with these uh, problems that we've been facing? Good evening, I'm the other Lee Howell of, of the event. I'm the Vice President and Chief Estimator with Burn Construction. That is a very common question we're hearing everywhere. Our plan, even from the very beginning, is to try to overcome those obstacles. So we're actually, anything that we can look to make sure we have diversity and, and um, competition among the bidding process, and even, in some cases, bidding some items early to overcome the lag time or the delayed availability. So we may be pre-purchasing pre steel decking, bar joists, things like that, which are the long lead items, which are the problems to overcome. In the commercial industry, doors haven't been an issue. It's usually currently been steel and then also rigid insulation and some roofing materials. And however, the rigid insulation roofing materials, if you plan ahead of time, they're not as much of a problem. Steel has been the current problem. Of course, that evolves every few weeks to a few months. And so as a team between the design firms, Burn, and the city, the client, we work together to overcome those early, and that's a great part of the CMAR process is that we're all on board early so we can find the obstacles and determine the best way to overcome those in a team environment. Are there any sort of new materials that are on the horizon that we would that we should consider using instead of the standard materials? Unfortunately, the items that are the long lead items that are the hard to get items are the ones that there aren't really alternatives for structural steel at this point. Where there are some facilities that we've worked with that are sort of reinforced foam, reinforced block. So those are options, concrete tilt wall, but you get very different aesthetics with some of those. So mm -hmm. we can evaluate those in any project. We can always look at different structural options, which may reduce the quantity of those. Every project's gonna have decking on the roof though, right now, that's the one product. We have projects where we've gotten rid of our joys completely. If it was a single story structure and we've gone entirely to wide flange steel, which is much more readily available than bar joists. However, the decking that sits on top of that, that spans the width, we haven't, no one's figured out how to overcome that yet. So yes, we are always open to and looking for new opportunities. Um, the current climate, the items that are in trouble aren't the ones that are easily um, substituted. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, and this may be a question for one of the Lee House, probably this one. Um, what is our tentative schedule, like groundbreaking schedule? What are, what are we looking at? Well, we're still uh, probably a year and a half to two years out from an actual groundbreaking. The architectural design process will continue well into the probably the fall of next year. Right. And then um, construction hopefully would, would start shortly after that, and that'll take about a year as well. So we're looking at potentially not construction until 23? Yes, sir, that'd be, be reasonable, late okay. 23. Okay. Council, other questions? All right, if not, I will entertain a motion. Any second? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you, so, gentlemen. Welcome. We're in business together. Good luck. All right. Item number twelve: consideration action regarding request to approve funding for a six-foot bronze statue to be prominently displayed at the main entrance of the new fire station. Fire Chief Doug Spears. Thank you again, Mayor and Council. We are seeking approval to expend existing funds from the central fire station budget to have a bronze statue created and placed at the primary entrance of the fire station. It was intentionally not included in the original scope of work to be mindful of the budget that we brought to you and you approved. I'm proud to say through diligent planning and project management, we have capacity within the existing budget to fund the statue uh, well within that budget. We still got a long ways to go, but we have capacity for other unforeseen things that may come up. It is a construction project. And as you can tell by driving by the site, we're still early on but the statue fits well within the budget. And we do have some photos in your packet, and I think Dolph's put them up on the screen, kind of what we're looking at. There's a likeness of one of our personnel that we intend to have the statue created in that likeness and placed where you see it up on the screen. With 
that, I'll answer any questions you might have. I have one. Um, I, I love this. This is beautiful. Um, are we going to have some sort of memorial in that area as well for any of our firemen, like um, Eddie Wood, uh, who have served we've here? And briefly discussed that, but no, no plans of yet. It may be something that we have a plaque somewhere in the inside the fire station. Okay, I didn't uh, know that was like any that. part Not, of this. I haven't planned anything for the exterior at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think, I think it looks awesome. I think it's a, a very big, nice addition to this uh, beautiful facility. I think it's great to have something like that. I think I it's a place where people can come up and take photos and stuff like that. Yeah. That's a common thing that people will do with those kind of statues. I just hope it doesn't look like Craver. That's all. That's no, my yeah. only request. Not, not him on this. Okay. No. And, and what does Sheldon think of this? Is he upset that he's not part of this? Uh... <laughs> uh, he, he approves. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. He is the most popular member of the fire department, isn't he? He by no, a long shot. Not even close. Yeah. No. You're right. Are any other questions for Chief Spears? If not, I will entertain a motion. May I make a motion that we approve the action regarding the request to approve funding for the six foot bronze statue as presented? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you Chief. All right. Item number 13. I'm one behind. Uh, project update on American with Disabilities Act transition plan. Matt Poole, Kimley Horn. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the city's ADA transition plan project. My name is Matt Poole, and I've been the project manager for five years plus so far on this project, so excited to present some of the great work we've done and I'll try to be brief but there is five years of progress and we want to try to keep you informed of everything we've done. Um, quickly on going through the agenda I'm going to introduce a project team who's been working for you for that length of time, uh, go through some of the goals and objectives and highlight why you need an ADA transition plan, it's a federal requirement, um, provide some backgrounds on the Americans with Disabilities Act and specifically Title II which relates to state and local governments. Um, describe how we've done it here in the city of Saginaw for a phased approach year by year making continuous progress on the plan and then talk to you about some of the prioritization of the improvements uh, for making things ADA compliant as well as the cost estimate for what we've looked at so far and then some action items for what we need to start thinking about in the future as we start to make those accessibility improvements. Um, so with the introductions myself again Matt Poole, Kimley Horn, um, been involved in all parts of the project and we have Chris Smith also on Kimley Horn. He's been really heavy with some of the production, heavy lifting, uh, data collection. There's a lot of data to be collected for this kind of a project. And we've also partnered with Accessology. They're a local firm here in North Texas and they specialize in accessibility. That's all they do. Um, and Stephen Lewandowski has been their project manager for this project and then Christy Avalos has been heavily involved as well. And we also want to thank the city staff. There's been a lot of city staff involvement. We have what's called an ADA liaison committee which is formed by city staff and it's really a group spearheading uh, progress on accessibility and Dolph and Rick as well as many others have been very involved so we really appreciate all the coordination and help. Many years, five years plus like I said. Um, so goals and objectives, what is an ADA transition plan? Really it's a master plan for accessibility. In the same way you've got roadway and utility master plans, you need to have a plan to uh, remove barriers to access and so what is a barrier to access? Well one example would be if you've got a sidewalk that leads up to a curb but there's no curb ramp that's a barrier because someone in a wheelchair is then stuck, they can't get down into the road to cross it. Um, so that's a pretty easy to grasp um, barrier. So we want to identify all those for all program services, activities, and facilities that are offered to your public, which is you know a long list of things. Um, we want to improve access, as I said, for all your citizens. Um, another part of the project, encouraging participation from the public and the disability community. We've achieved that through a survey as well as an online mapping tool for people to come and show us where they have areas of concern. That's been open uh, for almost every single project phase. Um, and then again, on top of the, the listing of the barriers, we want to let you know how to remove those over time and give you a cost estimate, prioritization as far as what should I remove in year one, what, or what should I fix in year one, what should we fix in year two, et cetera. And then help you understand some potential funding sources since the required funds can get large as we're fixing a lot of public infrastructure uh, out that's out there. 
So talking about the background on the ADA, again, this, so this is a federal requirement and really requirement under Title II for state and local governments is non-discrimination based on disability. You cannot discriminate to members of the public. They need to have equal access to everything um, as any other member of the public would. And so in order to do that, the requirement is that we have what's called a grievance procedure, which is a formal complaint process, formal grievance process for someone to say, I have an ADA or accessibility concern. We need to designate someone to oversee compliance with the ADA, and that person's called the ADA coordinator. It's been dull for the last several years, and we've recently transitioned that over to John Cervantes with the city. Um, and then we do what's called a self-evaluation and a transition plan. Self-evaluation means we're gonna look at everything that you offer to your public, figure out what's compliant, what's not under the ADA, and then the transition plan is how do we go from where we are now to bring everything into compliance. And so, like I said, we've been busy. Um, the numbering of the phases doesn't really correspond to the year that it occurred, but we just finished up phase 3B, um, and we're hoping to start phase 4A here soon. Um, so I'll just kind of briefly give you an update about what was included in each of those. Phase 1, we just kind of getting things going, establishing your formal transition plan. We established the ADA liaison committee that I mentioned, and as far as items that we reviewed, it's kind of the softer side, not your physical facilities, but the programs, procedures, and policies offered to your public. Um, it also includes employment practices, ordinances, emergency management plan. There can be discriminatory language in those things, and so we review all the language and recommend uh, changes to that to, again, not discriminate. And it got you the transition plan document in place, which is really your protection against the Department of Justice. If there was ever a complaint, they come and ask the city, hey, we've got an accessibility complaint, um, and your top defense is, well, we have an ADA transition plan, and so we'll move that complaint up in the list. It'll be addressed soon and then you're, you're you know, protected. Um, we also set up the documents where you would be able to uh, add things over time as the different facilities were reviewed. Is this document available online? Yes, it, it is, yeah, it has, has been, I think, through updated each year with each project phase on the city's website, yes. And that's actually a good question. It's kind of a requirement. We wanna make sure the public, I mean, it doesn't have to be available to the public, but it's very good to inform the public each step of the way what what's going on um, so in phase two or in the second year phase two a we looked at the city's parks um, this was where we first introduced the public outreach approach as well the survey and the map for members of the public to come add comments about areas of concern and then again the parks looking at all amenities in parks which include playgrounds tables benches restrooms um, parking lots sidewalks and ramps we got some pictures there showing some items of concern there's a playground with kind of a big lip all around it. If you're in a wheelchair, you can't get into that playground. Uh, similarly, there was some equipment that had some steps, but it didn't have a, a corresponding way that was kind of a ramp to access that equipment. So again, that equipment wasn't accessible to someone who's in a wheelchair. Um, just some sampling of the types of issues we saw in the parks. The next phase, third year, phase 2B, uh, we looked at the public buildings or the buildings that had public access. Um, so facility exteriors and interiors where the public does have access, employee only areas fall under Title I of the ADA, so we haven't looked at those. Um, again, parking lots, accessible parking spaces, and then the sidewalk and curb ramps. Again, some sample issues here. We've got a restroom where someone in a wheelchair is not able to roll up to that um, because there's a big concrete slab underneath it. Um, there's also supposed to be protection on the um, piping under the um, under the, the faucet there in case someone has numbness in their legs, they can you know, rub up against the piping and not know that they're uh, doing that. So those are just standard ADA requirements. And then similarly on the right side, there's a transaction counter that's too, too tall. 36 inches is the max height, um, again, for someone in a wheelchair uh, to be able to perform transactions. And so after the parks and the buildings, we'll start looking at your public right-of-way, which includes, we did have one additional building, which got added in this phase, but then we started really focusing on public right-of-way. So 13 signalized intersections, which include the push buttons to cross the street, curb ramps, um, path of travel through the street, or crosswalk. Um, and then also sidewalk. Audio as well? What's that? Do you have to have an audio on those crosswalks? Uh, that's a great question. So it, uh, it's, that one's a little difficult to answer. It's, it isn't required, but when there's new construction, significant upgrades, they are wanting at that time the audio to be installed. What's called an APS, a uh, audible pedestrian signal. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be a talking voice, but it can, you may have heard like the chirping noise. Right. Yeah, that's moving forward. That's where everything will be going. And with the, again, updates, those need to come in. 
Um, great question. Uh, and then sidewalk corridors, we've done 42 miles both in 2020 and 2021, last year and this year. Um, and sidewalk includes the full path of travel. So if we're crossing a driveway, if we're crossing a street, curb ramps, that entire path of travel has been looked at. Um, and the kind of issues we're looking for uh, on the sidewalks, there's a lot. Um, but like I mentioned, the push buttons, there needs to be a flat space next to a push button so that someone in a wheelchair can sit flat and hit the button. I keep focusing on wheelchairs as there's many different types of disabilities, but um, that's the example I'm using in some of these um, photo slides. But again, a, a flat area to hit the button so that the wheelchair doesn't roll. It's a stable surface. Um, this, this picture here didn't have that. It's almost a ramp right by the button. And then um, for side, you know, that's just one of many, many potential barriers. And then for sidewalks, um, this is an example of utility conflict. The box is sunk down. We've got a big lip around it. Um, anything greater than a quarter inch elevation change is technically an ADA violation. So these are very fine tripping hazards. Anything greater than a half an inch opening is technically an ADA violation. So these are the kind of things that we're noting all across town and developing a database to help you track and make improvements in the future. Um, Excessive cross slopes, that's a big one. A tipping hazard for someone in a wheelchair and just uncomfortable for all of us to walk on. It's a highly sloped sidewalk. Um, moving forward, we're gonna continue to look at the sidewalk corridors. We still have 62 miles. We plan to do 31 uh, fiscal year 2022 and 31 again the following year. And we're also working to develop an RGIS online dashboard. Wait, can I stop you? How many miles of sidewalk do we have? You have just over 100. Okay. 100, Approximately 105, but you keep developing, so the number keeps changing okay. over time. Today, 105. Okay. Today, Thank we're you. about 105, yes, sir. Um, and, and so, again, going back to the RGIS dashboard, this is really a, a robust database that allows you to understand the budget for the improvements, the prioritization, and this is just, it, it serves as an, or it works just as an online website, so you don't have to know about RGIS or have RGIS installed to be able to use it, but it will really give the city, um, a lot of good information as far as how to make decisions when planning those future improvements and how to integrate the dollars we have here with the projects that you're already doing, where ADA is already being improved. Um, so talking about the prioritization, a uh, separate schedule is developed for each facility type. I mentioned the parks, buildings, intersections, and curb ramps, and the sidewalks. But really, it's about addressing the areas of greatest risk first. Um, so that's going to be anywhere you've got a public complaint, pops to the top of the list, kind of like I mentioned earlier. Um, anywhere that's egregious outside of the standards. So if we've got a 2% maximum cross slope per ADA, I mean, then we measure a 12% slope, that's very dangerous. So that's gonna be a high priority. And then finally, your, your areas of greatest public use, where you have the most people using your facilities, the most public using your facilities, that's your area of highest risk versus maybe a neighborhood street that might have some sidewalk that's not great, but only the residents of that neighborhood are using that street. So that's how we prioritize. I am gonna show the costs broken down by priority. Um, so that's on this slide. Again, five years of work, a lot of things looked at. We are looking at over $14 million of identified improvements. But keep in mind, this is accessibility improvements only, and it's exclusive of any projects you're already planning. So all the sidewalk improvements, building renovations, park improvements that you already have planned, those will inherently fix accessibility issues on those sites. And so these aren't necessarily new dollars, but at the same time, you can understand the gravity of the amount of improvements that will need to be made over time. And we still have to look at some more sidewalks. So with that being said, it is a 10 year plus plan right now. And so one of the next steps is to start can, thinking. Can you go back to that? Yes. Um, that's 15, I mean, that's Yes, sir. 14, I mean, dollars. So you say low, medium, high. So yes. is that high being the highest risk? In, in other words, if I had to prioritize my money, them's the ones I'd go at first? That's correct. Okay, and then, yeah. then the medium and then the low when Yes, I get a couple extra points. And, and then even within each of those, we break, break each of those down into four. So you know there's high number one, high number two, because we right. completely understand that five, if you can't break up $5 million to know what's most important first, you're not going to be able to make good decisions. So. Now that $14.36 million, that's everything you all have evaluated to date. To date, okay, yes. Not for the next two years that you're still... That's correct. It does not include the 62 remaining miles of sidewalk. And as you can see, sidewalk is a big ticket item because uh, you guys you have a lot of it. <laughs> right. okay. um, but again, that's also over time, and it's okay. at least a 10-year-plus plan right now. So, and, that, and that's adjustable. The plan is really up to you all. That's it's your city's plan. You just need to 
dedicate funding and work your plan to kind of stay off the radar of the Department of Justice? Well, know? that's what I was going to say. That's not our plan. We, we can't choose not to do it because we could get sued by the federal government. That, that's exactly correct. You can't. You, you must do it. How you do it is the part that's your plan. But no, as far I mean, it's a federal requirement. It it's been around since 1991, and you're doing a great job as a city getting it done and having dedicated all the resources you have thus far to it. There are many cities across the country who are ignoring this, and they're putting themselves at severe risk for litigation. Uh, Los Angeles was the landmark case several years back, with hit with six billion dollar lawsuit to fix all their sidewalks. So. Mm. That's the kind of thing that we're trying to get ahead of by risk management with this kind of a project. So as long as we're making some progress year by year by year, we're, we're in, in compliance? Is that how it sort of works? That's exactly correct, yeah. Okay. It, it's, it, it, the, the federal government understands that you can't be expected to just overnight fix years and years and years of infrastructure. And so they really are looking for progress over time. Um, it needs to be reasonable. It can't be, we spent $5 last year. But right. uh, as long as you, you're exactly correct, as long as you're making progress over time, you're in the clear, okay. and doing what's required. So how do I know if that two inch drop around the corner from me in the 500 block of Opal is on the list of things to be repaired? I've watched the city repair on the other side of the street, but not on the side of the street with that. I mean, it, it's, it's a good Significant. two inch drop with the sink and the sidewalk. That's a great question. Um, so, and I know, sorry, this image is small here, but so we are recording everything spatially so you will be able to see the exact locations that we've looked at as far, in addition to the condition at those locations. And so from the, from the ADA transition plan database, every identified barrier is geolocated um, and available to you all for review. And so. Um, where do we find it? That is a good question. I'm not sure where it's currently stored. Do I, yeah. Well, this so yeah, so this map is not done. There is a database available still, like with, which which has been. It's not on the website, but it's in the city's hands as far as the files. So, but this map, so the database currently lives in GIS, which is um, you know specific software. ArcGIS is typically Esri ArcGIS is typically what you need to to have to access that. There's other ways of opening it, but. Our intention in making this map here is that it's just a website that any any member of the public or council or staff can visit and use to really understand some of those finer details. So, Rick, has our you just talking about logging ADA complaints? Is our uh, front end that we our fellow citizens can log into and put complaints? Does it have a box or something where we they can say, "Hey, this is." I don't think we have a specific ADA uh, geared response or complaint form, but we do receive complaints over the internet just through our our system, and so you know that's where we would probably see or target uh, you know do sidewalk problems or or, or other accessibility problems. Yeah. Do we have a policy or something we can point to that says that we any complaint that comes in we assess it for ADA? Not a policy per se, no. So, uh, isn't that part of your earlier thing that you had that? Yeah. The, the grievance process. Right. Right, yeah, and I mean, so having the process in place is a requirement, and whether, whether you receive those grievances specifically for ADA or you receive them broadly and filter them out right. isn't really, that's kind of up to you, but having an official way to make a grievance that can include ADA grievances, that's the requirement. So. And does the city have a policy for feedback to the person who's filed that complaint? And what's our no, time but, if, but if we have a complaint, let's say, for example, your two-inch drop on the sidewalk, I mean, if we, if we have a complaint like that, we typically go out and, and address those on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, we're able to be responsive on those. Now, if we get overwhelmed, I mean, you know, we our, our current budget is about twenty-five thousand dollars a year dedicated to sidewalks. Although we did pass a million dollars in certificates of obligation that we've used in Old Saginaw to try to improve accessibility, uh, well, you know, for safe pathways to schools. So, um, I know in 2018 my neighbor filed a complaint about that two-inch drop, and nothing's been done about it. 
Yeah, well, I'm sorry about that. So yeah, I guess no, he is. I mean, but he, he called. He didn't know about the online thing. And to be honest, I didn't know about it either until just a couple of years ago. Um, so that's why I'm wondering about the feedback. Are you getting back with the person that files that complaint and said, hey, you know where to put this on the schedule? It's going to happen in six months or a year. I can promise that we do do we we do investigate and, and that we do get back with the individuals who 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 come you know called in or typed in the complaint. So, but when people I call in, you know things are not always being logged. There is a there is a formal. I mean, there is a system that logs and maintains those records over time. So yeah, we have. I, I don't know what the what the life of that system is when those complaints fall off. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, but we could recover complaints, I'm sure, for several years. Uh, okay, because like I said, we're still waiting for that that portion of the sidewalk to be lifted. Yeah, well, we have 14 million dollars worth of <laughs> of need out there, but but again, if we if we hear a complaint, there's no feedback. As, as Matt said, that should go to the top of the list, and that we, if we have funds available, and and most of these. Are easily correctable. I mean, we can we, we can cut sidewalk and fill, or we can even grind. We've had areas on Park Center where we actually uh, ground uh, transitions that were having une uneven surfaces in the sidewalk. So we have multiple ways to try to respond to those issues. So well, and and you know, and my neighbor's not the only person I've heard complain about this. You know, I've heard other people come in and said they filed things through the online system and they've never heard back from the city. Well, I, and then nothing's been fixed. Yeah, I'd have so, to see uh, what they're, which ones they're talking about. I could just tell you that my, I know it's overwhelming. my experience is that staff is very responsive and when we get a complaint. I know it's overwhelming with the complaints that come in, but, you know, they all need to be addressed and the courtesy needs to be yes. sent back. Yes, yeah, people the deserve people. an answer, whether the answer is no, we can't do anything at this right. moment. You're right. I agree with that. So do we have plans to fix that? at least look into that problem yeah if if you could help us out and send those addresses and names maybe in an email to rick then we can get randy and streets out there and well, also know, pull up the records so i know a couple of people that have filed the complaints are deceased so they're kind of hard to get a hold of now say that again i said a couple of people that have filed complaints are deceased but i know the areas that they're talking about sure again the addresses would be helpful if you can help us out i promise you we'll get staff out and and we'll we'll take care of it well and we can review review the process too to to make sure that people are aware of the portal to to direct those sorts of complaints so they get addressed well and that's the thing the yeah. citizens need to know how to you know properly file the complaints whether it's a phone call or through the portal and uh, and then also review how that's responded to yep. is what I'm asking but yes I will get you the uh, elevator drop on Opal Street. It's the 500 block. Gabe, is that something that you could maybe include in the, with the water bill or something, a little flyer that, you know, you know, if you've got this, here's a portal that you can. Sure. Yeah. Uh, just I some mean, of just our. Just as an idea. No, it's, it's a good point. Some of our garage gabs, I think there was one on park, uh, park center court. There was an ADA issue and you know people generally tell us and my regards to your neighbors who passed away but like I say if we know about it we'll take care of it um, that was all I had to, to present if there are any further questions happy to discuss any questions for Matt Mary um, you mentioned a 10-year plan yes and is that 10 years just the assessment of what needs to be done or does it include the actual fixing of the problems that's a great question so at this point we have identified 10 years for the fixing of the problems but we still have two more years of evaluation of existing facilities so as we do those two years there will be additional dollars identified for needed improvements and then that may trigger the need to reconsider if 10 years is appropriate or if it will take longer than that because there's more funding needed and any new construction that happens in the city from the time this was enacted has to follow those requirements, correct? That is correct. I mean, theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> that is the, and the, so, the goal, the so it's, it's just the older parts of the city 
that need to be looked at primarily? Yes, the, the goal is that, so we looked at design standards in the very beginning so that to, to try to ensure that new construction is constructed in compliance. Um, so at that point in time, we, we, we evaluated the design standards, we looked at every, we identified everything else that we need to look at and then anything new from that point really is not being heavily reviewed because again, as you mentioned, the assumption is that it's being constructed under compliance. Now, whether or not that happens is, you know, that, that's really on ensuring that contractors are, and, and designers are, are doing their due diligence and following compliance, but that is the strategy we've taken, yes. Uh, and I'll just add to that. Our projects are reviewed by the uh, Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation to ensure that it meets AD, it's ADA compliance. So all of our ramps, our cross slopes, old sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera, are compliant. Now, the other factor, though, is that we live in an area with uh, very active soil. So you could build it to standard. TDLR could inspect it and pass it and say you're good. And you know, two years later, after a wet season, you're not good anymore. So I mean, it, it's a, it, it never really totally goes away, even in new construction. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It, that, it, it, it's not like we're creating a fourteen million dollar list, and that's the list. You know, like he said, uh, even within the same areas or even new construction, that that list could grow. So. The only other question I have is. You have identified many areas that need improvement. And even before the improvements start being made, our city may independently decide to fix some of these things. Correct, and that's happening. So some, you know, some of them are being done ahead of time just because they're important, you know, they're, they're causing a problem. Yeah. And we have the funds. <laughs> Correct. And, so. It, and so that listing is, is everything we would identify, but it doesn't account for any improvements during those five years. So those have been made too. So the list has actually shrunk. Um, but yeah, to your point, yeah, there's, there's always good work being done. And so it's, it's gotten a little shorter. <laughs> Other questions for Matt? Yeah. I mean, Rick, I guess see, to, to me, I, can, I, I see as dividing this into two. One is, things were installed with now that are not compliant with ADA. The sidewalks and stuff, that's things that could have been compliant, like they got driven back from there and stopped. But just over time, just like my driveway, it kind of shrinks a little. Now it's out of compliant when it gets this magical change. So, I mean, the big thing is, is we got 14.5 million. You know, you sit there and say, uh, you know. Today's dollars. Yeah, today's dollars. But that's all we can go on today. I mean, we can put some inflation in if we're going to make sure that. Uh, but let's say that we think half of that is maintenance, you know, of these sidewalks. Are we doing anything? Are we putting anything in the budget, a million dollars a year? Should we do a million dollars a year? And let's say that we got 10, 12 million that it's actually things we're going to have to go tear out and refix, like the sinks and stuff. Are we doing anything like that now to begin to start that? We. Again, we only, history is at least since I've been here is that we've only dedicated about twenty five thousand a year or forty thousand a year for sidewalk work. So you know that's just a drop in the bucket for what the problem is. So I mean, it gets back to what Matt said. Once we've identified the scope of work, which would be the entire city, and the next, next two remaining phase, and what is our plan to address that, and is it re and is it reasonable? Because you have to balance that against competing you know issues elsewhere in the city i mean parks just just playgrounds etc uh, libraries things of that nature so you know what is our plan are we going 25,000 is paltry probably i mean we, we wish we had a million dollars a year that would be great to address the issue but again you know we we have a budget to consider you have a budget to consider and in competing interests so that, here's my problem i hate wasting money and if we're paying these, these people a tremendous amount of money, I'm assuming. They've, they've been doing it now for five years, got two more, seven years worth of work. I'm, I'm sure we cost a little bit. And I expect after that, or even now, we start working on fixing or else why even get the estimate unless we're just playing a game of trying to keep the federal government in service. 
You see what I'm saying? I mean, we we got we got fourteen point three six million dollars worth of things we need to fix. We know we need to fix them, or give or take a few percent. We need to start allocating now to get those fixed. Why are we not done? It ain't you. I'm, I guess yeah. it's us. It's, it's a good question. We need to put a plan together. It's a good point. I, I think the answer is we're working on it incrementally. Our new facilities, you know, are ADA compliant. Somebody mentioned the playground. So Willow Creek Station, the previous playground was outdated. And, you know, so now that's in compliant and we'll make progress each time. Right. Um, you know, like Knowles, when Knowles is reconstructed, we'll have sidewalks and approaches that are ADA compliant, that sort of thing. So we'll keep chipping away at it. And I think we can draw special attention to it in the CIP. Um, you know, noted as part of project. When we did, uh, was it in 18 or 19, we did a million dollars for sidewalks. Was that 19? I forget. The CO. The CO issue, a million, and again, I said, you know, we're we're uh, dedicating those funds so far to new sidewalks in, in Old Saginaw mm. to, to feed Saginaw Elementary. And so we've got, I think, a balance after this last contract. Just using the estimate, that project hasn't been bid. But we'll probably have three hundred thousand uh, dollars left over, you know, to, to use wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, we could dedicate that to ADA and yeah. I mean to to ramps and et cetera throughout the other parts of the city that that are high priority. You know, when we started this, I wasn't sure how this was going to go. My assumption was it would be city facilities, buildings would be the biggest hit, and I was wrong. Uh, it's obviously sidewalks and intersections, which I did not uh, appreciate. That's sort of why we did this assessment. We didn't know where we we stood. Um, four years ago. So this is why we've gone through this process to get data because we didn't have any data. We had guesses, but we didn't know really where we were. So that was the big the big point of Matt's uh, long, lengthy exercise is to, is to get us some real hard data to know what to, to attack. And then, yes, you're right. We will have to start chipping away at each budget year, probably going forward for the next decade or, or longer. We'll have something dedicated to, to ADA in it. We'll just have to, to plan on going forward. Well, and as Gabe mentioned, I mean, anytime we have a, a capital project or even a maintenance project, or we touch that street right away, mm -hmm. then we would look at the ADA, you know, to bring it up to standard at that time. So that, that's another area where we can use to kind of whittle at the problem. Right. All right. Any other questions for Matt? All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. And certainly. So moving on to 14. 14 is consideration action regarding individual project order with Kimley Horn and Associates for ADA transition plan phase 4A, intersection and sidewalk eval. We just heard about that, so this is to put some money, some dollars where money where our mouth is kind of thing. So, uh, and this is Dolph Johnson. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as Matt just uh, showed, we have two phases of our evaluation plan left to go. This is the next to the last one. So. We budgeted for this this year, $80,000 for this phase, and, and so uh, we have those funds available and uh, Matt's ready to get to work. So we asked the council to approve the IPO and we get started on this. Uh, the purpose of Matt's presentation tonight, we asked him to, to bring this update to y'all so y'all can be thinking about mm -hmm. the future and you are going to have to start setting aside some funds each year to start addressing these issues. And so, uh, you know, once we're done with the consultants, then we can start putting hard dollars. But we are working on some of the things uh, as he mentioned John Cervantes is our new ADA coordinator and he's he's currently going through and make sure all of our policies and procedures are up to date to the ADA, ADA requirements so there's things we can do that aren't concrete uh, that, that he's working on now so we're slowly working through these but uh, we recommend approval of the IPO for this phase any questions on this item council so just to be clear the eighty thousand dollars in this item is strictly for um, Mr. Poole's work, right? Correct. Okay. Other questions, Council? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Mayor, I move that uh, we uh, approve the individual project order with uh, Kimberly Horn and Associates for the ADA transition plan phase 4A intersection and sidewalks. Thank you, Mayor. Do I have a second? Mr. Tucker, second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Oh, excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate your work. Item number 15, mental health services update. Sergeant Robin Espinosa. Welcome. Hi, Mayor and City Council. I'm Robin Espinosa. I'm Administrative Sergeant 
at the Saginaw Police Department. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Tarrant County Mental Health Jail Diversion Center. Um, problem, currently what we have, uh, the problem is law enforcement currently only has three options for mentally ill suspects. We can release with no action, we can arrest, or do a notification of emergency detention. The jail and emergency detention are only short-term problems that do not address the core of the problem, which is mental health. So solution, a center operated by MHMR, which is uh, abbreviated for My Health, My Resources. Services that are going to be provided are psychiatric providers, primary care providers, registered nurses, licensed staff, transitional slash aftercare staff, peer specialists, and various program staffs. So the mission statement is to provide a recovery-orientated short-stay alternative to incarceration for nonviolent justice involved persons with mental health needs. Services, per, a participant must voluntarily consent to the diversion. Provide immediate mental health and primary health care interventions targeted to the needs of jail diversion center participants. It's going to access and engage program participants in treatment, providing a continuum of care. Access and connect to programs that can address the need of jail diversion center participants, such as housing programs, community based health uh, aftercare, benefits assistance, outreach to families, and other MHMR external programs. Some of the benefits. Uh, benefits to law enforcement and jail operations. It will provide an additional option to address the needs of low-level, nonviolent, mentally ill offenders. Quick drop-offs which allow law enforcement to return to other public safety duties faster. Reduce recidivism for mental health, jail, diversion center participants. And by reducing the recidivism, officers are less likely to have future contacts with participants. Sergeant, can I stop real quick? Yes. Can you explain to us currently today, you talked about the quick drop-off. Today, what's the process? Um, right now, depending on the, what officers are getting called to, um, what I'm going to go over is what the qualifiers are and the disqualifiers. Um, but with criminal trespass is going to be a, a, is what has to be required for the um, criminal offense. Um, but I couldn't tell you as far as, uh, I mean, each call is separate, mm -hmm. different. But it's going to be up to the individual entity that's calling us with in regards to the criminal trespass if they want to prosecute. Um, say, for instance, they do want to prosecute, we, could, we take them in, we'll arrest them. Then at that point in time, you're booked in, you get uh, transported to Tarrant County. Um, then you have, with mental health, uh, it could have a court-appointed attorney. Um, but that's some more information I'm going to give you actually okay. here soon. Right. So, um, but by reducing recidivism, officers are less likely to have future contacts with participants. Some additional benefits, um, it'll eliminate entire criminal case process, including arrest, review, criminal case filing, and all court involvement for MHJDC participants. And eliminate the jail booking time, reduce the number of low-level, non-violent, mentally ill offenders in the jail population, which in turn reduces the jail population. And it'll reduce the costs associated with mental health def defendants, such as jail costs, including medical and mental health care appointed and court-appointed attorney fees. Um, so in order to be eligible, one of the criteria is criminal trespass. That is the only criminal offense that makes this, uh, a person um, eligible uh, for this diversion program. Criminal trespass is the most frequently followed offense committed by individuals with mental health needs. Um, these are situations where you've got somebody that is uh, essentially what you would call loitering. Um, a business entity calls us, says, hey, this person's uh, on our property. We don't wish them to be here. Most of the time, you know, they, they'll say, we just want them gone. Um, we've had instances where people refuse to leave, and then the situations could escalate. Um, so one of the criteria is, is there has to be a criminal trespass. Um, mental health or mental illness, substance abuse, and homelessness are prevalent among persons committing this offense. Now, in Tarrant County in 2020, 60% of incarcerated individuals had a confirmed mental health diagnosis. Data for 2021 is trending even higher with 68% from January 1 to June 30th. And these are uh, cases in Tarrant County. Is this for both adults and juveniles? No, this is uh, part of the eligibility criteria is going to be 18 years of age or older. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Go ahead. One, why, is it, why does it only have to be criminal trespass? 
Um, well, at this point, for part of the eligibility criteria, um, most of these that are, in, in, as far as criminal trespass, have a mental health, they're nonviolent. Um, that's, w would I get um, through some more of the dis eligibility criteria, it'll probably it'll answer more of your questions and as far as the disqualifiers, and it'll explain to you a little bit more why um, just criminal trespass. Um, what's the other question? The other question mm -hmm. is the statistical numbers you gave there for Tarrant County. Yes, sir. Do you have those for Saginaw? Uh, no, sir, I do not. No, sir. Um, with us, because a lot of our contacts, um, you know, we, we'll go, we can make contact for somebody, say the, the business entity says, I don't want to prosecute, I just want them gone. Most of them will just leave. There's been times that the situation has actually escalated um, where we have filed criminal trespass on individuals um, uh, in that regard. But the numbers, I think, would be essentially skewed in the fact that um, a lot of the contacts, you, you get voluntary compliance, but all we do is they move and they just move on to another entity or to another another jurisdiction. So, um, continuing with the eligibility, eligibility criteria, um, they have to commit criminal trespass. Um, they cannot be, they cannot pose a threat to public safety, 18 years of age or older, and they must also consent um, voluntarily to be diverted to the mental health jail diversion center. And they, cannot appear to be experiencing mental health crisis that meets the criteria for notification of emergency detention. That says jail division center. Uh, jail diversion center. Jail, okay. Yeah. So it's still jail? Uh, no, this is a, a diversion from going to jail. So oh, this okay. program essentially is what it's doing, is it's jail reducing, gotcha. yeah, so. Um, and some of the disqualifiers, um, if they have a class B or above warrant, they're not eligible. Offenses, again, um, other than criminal trespass, like I said, right now, this, the, the, um, the uh, MHMR has only um, opted just to keep it at criminal trespass. Down the road, they've talked, and they may um, introduce other offenses, but this time they're leaving at criminal trespass. Um, they cannot uh, disqualify um, if they present violent or assaultive behavior, and, um, or if they meet the criteria for a notification of emergency detention. Um, such as so substantial risk of harm to self or others due to mental illness or is deemed a public safety threat by a peace officer, um, or if a person um, requests treatment in an emergency room, that's also a disqualifier. So what happens is we go out, we get a call, somebody's uh, on somebody's property, they don't, want to, they don't want to prosecute, they just want the person gone. As long as the person, we, we off, as officers, we'll offer them you know, the ex information in regards to the diversion program, um, uh, they, they have to voluntarily say, yes, I want to go. Um, if they need any type of medical treatment whatsoever, then they're not eligible for this diversion program. This is only for people who are not in a mental health crisis, do not need any type of uh, medical assistance at that time, um, and like I said, voluntarily uh, go. Prohibited camping um, is not eligible. Um, class C offenses, uh, which is a class C offense, and class Cs are not eligible for this program. Hmm. Now, a little bit about the facility itself. It's located at it's located at 812 West Morphy Street in Fort Worth. Um, it is going to be 24/7, 365 day uh, law enforcement access. Licensed with 34 beds to accommodate guests. Um, they will not accept pets. Um, they are expecting um, some of the participants to have multiple visits. Uh, Recidivism is not a barrier to returning. Um, officers will sign in the participants on a kiosk and then turn them over to the staff. It's operated by MHMR and owned by Tarrant County, and Tarrant County Sheriff's Office is gonna be responsible for the facility security. It is up to each individual agency within Tarrant County to establish the policies um, regards to uh, this program. Now these are some frequently asked questions, and then um, some of these might actually answer some of the questions y'all already asked. And, uh, but, um, can the public drop off at the center? No, um, it must be presented to the MHJDC by a peace officer. If the person meets the eligibility criteria, do I have to utilize the MHJDC option? No, uh, the peace officer has the discretion as to best handle the call for service. There's not a limit to how many times the same person can be dropped off. And there is, uh, there's no criminal cases that are being filed against the person. So there's no arrest, there's no judge, there's no bond, and there's no court-appointed attorney. So how long is their stay? 
how long is their stay? It can be as long as they need. Um, they're going to um, offer them the services, and then based on the uh, the staffing uh, and what you know their mental health um, status is, it's up to them how long they can stay. They're going to be offering aftercare resources such as um, housing, um, like the medical, the psychiatric care, getting them in touch with family members, um, try to help them with their mental mental health status. So in, in Saginaw, mm -hmm. how, many, uh, how many of the contacts, contacts you all make with uh, people who have mental issues do we think would fall into this category? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. You know, we haven't um, we haven't tracked that before this center became available. Um, it's not going to eliminate a lot of our our mental commitments, like when in, when somebody actually is in crisis. So that's that's there's a number of those. Um, I mean, and I think uh, we do probably about one of those a week on the average. Um, so those don't qualify for this. What it, it's the specific criteria that you know this is involved with in in our city is going to be somewhere significantly less than that, probably in terms of our utilization of it. Yeah, Kim. Um. You mentioned that, you know, the person has to agree yes, to go. And then uh, Nick asked, or no, Cindy asked, how long do they stay? Or somebody asked that. And you said, well, it's up to them. Did you mean it's up to the facility? The, the facility and the participants. So what if they disagree? Um, so the, it's on a voluntary basis. So if the participant says, you know what, I'm done, I don't want to be here anymore, they're free to leave. Okay. There's nobody's going to keep them from um, leaving. Okay. Um, another question, um, common question, is there a civil case uh, filed against the person, such as mental health? No, the person will not meet the criteria for a notification of emergency detention or the filing of requests for an order of protective custody or application for temporary mental health services. And another question, common question is, will the MHJDC accept charges beyond criminal trespass? Currently, criminal trespass is the only eligible offense. Um, what about weapons? Uh, it is very common for um, uh, these individuals to have weapons, but they are not going to be allowed to have them on their person while in the facility, but they have a secured uh, lock storage outside. Um, residency requirements. The only thing that is required is that the offense has to have occurred in Tarrant County, the criminal trespass, <coughs> uh, as, an, as um, to be offered as an alternative to arrest. And tentatively, the open date is set for the last week in December. So, okay, are there any additional questions? What's the difference between this facility and, let's say, a night shelter? Um, this facility, okay, so night shelters, just from my own personal experience, uh, just on the job, I'm just, uh, <laughs> is, they just offer them, most of them are just a, hot, uh, a warm place to sleep. Um, this place here, they're offering them the bed, but they're also offering them the medical, the psychiatric need. There's licensed care uh, on the facility or on site at all times um, and to give them the, the resources that they need um, to try to keep, the, essentially to keep them out of the jail become a part of that snowball. Um, okay. my, my own personal experience from working in patrol, I know of three people that could have utilized this over probably the last five or six years um, that, you know, like I said, that could have used this. Um, and then once that's, you know, they would get, we'd arrest them and they just, that cycle would continue and propel, so. And what's the cost to the city for this program? Right now it's totally funded through Tarrant County. Okay. There has been no mention of any kind of funding uh, program or funding formula to to put out to the cities. And I, and I think one other thing I might just add is the from the discussions that Tarrant County's had on this pro, on this project. Um, I think you can consider the criteria that that Sergeant Espinosa has outlined as a beginning point. Mm -hmm. and kind of a trial run it could expand from there to other offenses that qualify and and a little different criteria 
but it's mainly to allow for people that um, that are have mental health issues that we find unsheltered in the city that don't need to go to jail but that's all we can do with them or the main thing that we can do with them so it is a small pop part of the population but it could become a, a larger solution to other issues and one final question is there any uh, additional training that uh, your officers need for this program what we're doing is um, I've attended the training where I can teach it to the officers. We've also sent several of our supervisors um, and making them aware of it. Um, meantime, our administration is going to have to set a policy in place as far as reports goes, but that's it. So, Yes, Mary. Um, this is probably for Chief Howell. <laughs> My ears are popping, so I feel like I'm in the mountains. Do Am I yelling? No, you're good. Okay. You're good. <laughs> Um, so this is a great, great project, and I, I believe the police department in Saginaw has recently upgraded the training for the mental health issues mm -hmm. to help the officers be able to, you know, work with that better. But my question is, you, you have an officer that gets called out on one of these calls, and Quite often that person might be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So how difficult is it for an officer to determine, is this a drug or alcohol problem or is this a mental health problem or is it both? Well, I'll, uh, go In ahead. other words, if they were just under the influence of something, they wouldn't be eligible for this. But then how do you know they don't have a mental health problem if well, they're under the influence of something? Yeah. Um, as officers, when we go on scene, you know, we, we've got standardized field sobriety where you can tell if somebody is actually in a mental, if they're having a mental health crisis to the point where um, they're a danger to themselves or others, then they're, they're not eligible for this program. Um, this is, you know, for mental health. If somebody is to the point where they're highly intoxicated, then we, we'd have, we go a different route. But if they're highly intoxicated, then they can't give voluntary consent in that regard. If there's anything that has, that would warrant them having to go to uh, a mental app, notification of uh, emergency detention that's they wouldn't be eligible for this they would go to the hospital instead so. say we put some say you all put somebody in jail that is on some substance or alcohol and then the next morning you know that it's gone but yet then the underlying problem issue comes up of this can you then transfer them from your jail to this? No, this is strictly for going from the scene where we're called okay. straight to this diversion. Very program. narrow focus. Yes, very, <laughs> it's a straight line. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no curves in this. Yeah. Where's the facility located? It's going to. Uh, this is Morphy Street. Morphy Street. I think it's uh, 812 West Morphy Street in Fort Worth. The access um, officer is going to drop off, they pull up and they draw, drop off in the back of the facility um, to help kind of minimize, um, I guess, the attention to the, res the facility itself. We, at the Tarrant County Mayor's Council a few months ago, we had a presentation from the district attorney about this very project, and she's a, a big proponent of this. And part of the way she presented it to us was that, you know, there's a large percentage of the people that are pulled over have mental health issues, and there's a certain percentage of those that are not violent. Uh, that you don't need to waste going through the court system. That's sort of what this is a diversion. And she said, you know, Sergeant Espinosa said it's voluntary. I think what we mean by voluntary is that you can go to jail or you can go to this diversion center. So it's sort of voluntary, but I, I think it's a good way to present it is these people will give it just another option. Uh, and also it was presented to us it will take our officers back, put our officers back on the street quicker. Yes. If you have to go to JPS or even to back here to, to Saginaw to book somebody, that takes a lot of your time. Yes. Like how much of your time? Uh, I mean, if you're going, if you're going, to have to, if you're having to go downtown and you, um, and just drop somebody, you're going straight there and back. I don't know what the, as far as sure, no, the mileage is mm. between there and back. But if you, um, depending on what night of the week it is and which, what else is going on in the city, taking somebody and booking somebody, and you're looking at at least a minimum of an hour, okay. depending on you know if they, you got somebody coming into the jail, um, depending, like I said, depending on those circumstances, but a minimum of an hour at, at least. Yeah. It's 14 miles. 14 miles. Yeah. So. And, and this was presented to us that it should be a lot quicker at this diversion center. It should be pretty quick for an officer to drop off someone. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So they don't have to book somebody. It's no. not an official process. So it's much quicker to get back on the street doing your job as opposed to dealing with this. So that, and I thought it was a great idea. Um, I know we've sort of where policing is going is to dealing with more of the mental health issue because that's a lot of what we encounter, what we all encounter. So I think it's a great program. Uh, we talked about dollars. One thing that uh, the district attorney mentioned to us was in the future they may come to cities and ask for a uh, a fee from each city, like a dollar per resident kind of thing, uh, to help run this facility. But they're really uh, the first year is sort of a trial to see how it goes, how expensive it is, how how needed it is, how many uh, participants they have, and how you know. So that would uh, indicate what kind of staff they would need going forward. So it's a good start, but I'd like to, interested to see how it's going to go. I hope it's uh, very beneficial. Any other questions for the sergeant? Okay. This is definitely. We all know that mental health is an, is an issue. You've read the reports and things. It's just unfortunate. I'm definitely myself. It's not something that I'm familiar with or, or even can kind of get my head wrapped around. So that's why I was asking so many questions. No, that's good. Trying to learn from it. So I appreciate it. Yeah, perfect. Well, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Sergeant. All right. Item number, that's 415. Item number 16, discussion of future staffing needs for the City of Saginaw. City Manager Gabe Graham. Mayor and Council, we have a few slides. The intent is to bring some of these items to your attention as we... Uh, talk through things in, in uh, future budget years. So uh, each department has a slide and I'll defer to some of the departments to explain the specifics, but just as a frame of reference, we are a hair under 25,000 now in population with all of our uh, activity in the city. We'll go from 25,000 to 30,000 pretty quickly. So uh, when we have more people to serve, desirable community to live, uh, and new people come in every day that requires uh, more staff resources and, and uh, requests for programs and services. Uh, building safety and code compliance, we covered some of this uh, with a previous update on the rental and, and code enforcement. So looking forward to the future of the next uh, couple budget years. Uh, there was mention of a code officer. Uh, if you'll recall from the code and rental inspection um, presentation we really only have one code officer in the street the manager does the paperwork so you know one code enforcement officer for a city of our size is is pretty thin um, based on volume and again refer to the previous uh, presentation on the rental inspection program uh, would request a rental inspector which we may recommend to you mid-year um, we have a revenue source there's a fee for rental units that we can fund that so uh, that's something we're thinking about, as well as administrative help. So, Larry, any comments, color commentary on that? I, whatever you'd like, or if we can pause each. questions on building code okay uh, public works so um, good for water and wastewater at this uh, point in time you'll recall we added a wastewater tech position in this year's uh, budget a new um, full-time position we've run in the situation which is common in all of our departments where we can't uh, or we're having tremendous difficulty finding certified candidates, so we're having to train people so that they get certifications. That's the intent of that tech position, to hire somebody and, and train them up. Um, Mary Regal is uh, going to retire early in 2022, so we'll have some staff shifts related to that. Uh, but we, we may need some, um, some uh, plan review help in the future, especially... I'll make a public plea to request that Rick Trice extends his tour of duty. He'll tell me no yet again. Uh, but anyway, um, I will work through 
It's like you know. a broken record, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll work through um, some of the staff changes um, based on retirements and anticipated vacancies. So the one new request uh, would be to have a dedicated superintendent. So right now we have, uh, uh, and maybe I'll just let Rick. Yeah, right now the the uh, department has two maintenance groups or uh, field personnel, the, the water and wastewater on one side and then park streets and facilities on the other. Uh, what happens in practice is that that uh, streets and facilities always tend to get the priority. So we would, we would want to break the streets uh, and the facilities, et cetera, and the parks into two separate sections so park gets dedicated, um, you know, uh, attention. It will make that function more effective, focus on our parks because they begin, uh, the parks begin to be the stepchild of all those functions. So we'd want to dedicate some supervision there. With new developments, uh, we'll, we'll continue to acquire some public space uh, responsibilities for maintenance, so it becomes important. Any questions before we move on? Uh, Fire Department, I'll let Chief Spears handle that. Thank you, sir. I'll be very brief, but don't, please don't let that diminish the importance of the request or forecasting for the positions. Uh, one shift firefighter that's been a request since uh, budget year 2015 where we requested three people. We've since added two. We have uneven shifting. I, I think y'all are well, well aware of that position. Administrative assistant or technician. We're not using our uh, time wisely for the chief and the assistant chief. There's many administrative duties that are normally filled by administrative staff and that's a, a, a tremendous support in everything we do having that position in the, in the fire department. I think that same uh, desire or need exists in the police department and then the assistant fire marshal or uh, public safety education specialist. As y'all know, we are heavy industrial in the city. We have a low fire loss. That's for a good reason. I like to think we're doing a good job at that. That takes a lot of our time. And as we grow, that our commitment to that keeps getting diminished. We need to make sure we upkeep that. A loss of any one of our significant businesses in town is going to have such an economic impact that it's smart to make sure that that doesn't happen where we can. And with that, I'll end. Uh, community and Economic Development and Recreation Services. Keith couldn't be here uh, this evening. Uh, Jason England is is with us uh, in case there's questions. So uh, you all probably saw over the weekend our special events continue to grow uh, in popularity. The food truck, um, the switch yard has, has exceeded everybody's expectations. So uh, having somebody in the future to keep up with that specifically with special events. Uh, train and Grain is uh, uh, a year-long project in planning. Janice England and um, Karen Cromwell and Randy Newsom did a great job corralling um, committee to work through that. Uh, but our again, our events continue to grow. Uh, recreation Services Coordinator to assist the recreation manager. Uh, and then Keith does a little bit of everything. He does all of our city communications as well as uh, uh, social media uh, outreach at this point. So... Um, having a dedicated staff person to um, handle some of those functions. Our senior center uh, and some of this um, will be related to when we have a new facility and more space and the ability to program a future full-time additional person in a part-time um, and then potentially some part-time folks uh, for staffing needs. Uh, and then Animal Services is also part of Keith's group, and they are requesting um, a future technician. Unfortunately, with Animal Services, we're at or near capacity almost constantly. Um, and for the nature of the business is they're always at that. So the technician does a lot of the care and feeding and cleaning and that sort of thing. Any questions this area? Uh, police department, I'll let Chief Howell handle that. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Assistant Chief Ragsdale to discuss this with you. On 
Mr. Mayor and Council, thank you all for letting me be here today. Uh, I prepared two presentations, uh, about an hour and a half each, so we'll be a little bit. <laughs> Sounds good. But we'll hit the highlights and go pretty quick on this. Uh, in your packet, you have a, a presentation for our patrol side. What I want to start off, though, with is our dispatch side. That wasn't included in the packet. So, a um, little history about our dispatch center is there's 13 incoming uh, call lines, six of those are 911, seven of those are administrative. Our dispatchers handle NCIC, TCIC, which is our warrant confirmations, uh, uh, be on the lookout for and things of that nature that, that address crime. Uh, they're responsible for monitoring radios for our officers in the street. Normally there's five to six officers on the street at any given time, so the, they're kind of the heartbeat uh, of, that, of the police department in general. We currently have five full-time dispatchers uh, and one dispatch supervisor. That's the same number that we've had since, uh, or actually between 2008 and 2017. In 2013, uh, we replaced the supervisor that was a, a civilian supervisor with a sworn officer. Uh, that officer at times uh, was fully certified as a dispatcher as well. We also increased the staffing to six dispatchers. So in essence, you had six dispatchers and one full-time uh, supervisor that was also trained in dispatch. Um, our population during this same time has grown uh, 31 percent. Uh, our call services have grown as well, uh, but the dispatch count has relatively remained the same. And so when we're looking at uh, average calls that our dispatchers take uh, on those 13 lines, there's 44,568 calls over the last year uh, that they handle. Uh, you think of a major accident that occurs here in town, it's not just one phone call that they're answering. Every line lights up, every 911 call, every admin line. So one person trying to deal with 13 calls coming in. Um, with dispatch is also tied to our ISO rating through the fire department. And so our ISO rating right now, I believe, is a two. Um, one of the dings that we got on that audit in the, the previous audit was one dispatcher being on, on duty because all these calls come through our dispatch center before being transferred to fire and EMS. So um, when you start looking at staffing in our dispatch center, then that does affect our ISO rating as well. So, so what's the recommended What's, what's best practices for that? <clears throat> so just like the staffing study you had for patrol, there's not like a best practices staffing for that. There's probably half a dozen different uh, staffing models to look at. Um, when you look at our calls for service, you look at the responsibilities that are there, uh, you're looking at roughly um, six dispatchers just to answer the calls. Uh, that doesn't include the radio traffic and all the other. Uh, so you're looking at two dispatchers per shift um, in most of those models. Right now we're sitting at five, so you're looking at eight dispatchers um, to man all shifts, and then you'd have a relief dispatcher to cover vacations and things of that nature. So it'd be an increase of about four dispatchers over what we have right now in general. Uh, if you and want to just many, cut down to it. And how many calls do we get approximately an hour? I don't, I don't have the hourly broke or down per shift, this, but uh, it was 44,568 for the year. For the year? Um, yes, ma'am. So, and I was so just trying to figure I can kind of give you a breakdown in, in 18 and 19, uh, our average queue time, so that's the time that 911 rings to the time that they actually uh, get it entered in the system, was about five minutes and 52 seconds. Dispatch time was a solid six minutes. Um, again, that was five dispatchers, that was vacancies throughout the year. In 1920, uh, we had a pretty much a full staffing complement. We had our dispatch, sick dispatchers and our one. Uh, sworn supervisor that was certified as well. That reduced our queue time down to four minutes and 28 seconds and our overall dispatch time to four minutes and 37 seconds. So you're talking about a minute and a half uh, reduction in response time on that side. And that's not the officer responding to the scene. Uh, there's additional time that goes with that. I think our average response time is sitting around six minutes or so uh, in addition to what this time would be. And then in 20, fiscal year 2021, uh, we promoted a one of our dispatchers to a civilian supervisor. We removed the sworn person from there to get that person back on the street. Um, when we did that, we also lost that six position. So we have five dispatchers and the one supervisor. Um, and just how that affects our, our queue time and calls. Our queue time has gone back up to five minutes and 19 seconds with the overall dispatch time of five minutes and 28 seconds. So, um, you see that just even one person has a pretty detrimental effect as, as to our response times that that go in there. So based off the, the latest couple of, of staffing analysis that I've done there in, in for dispatch, 
we're looking at about a four four dispatcher increase to meet what they consider to be standards and, and to satisfy our ISO rates. So, so from that, I'll move on to patrol. You have that packet there with you. I've done two different studies there. Um, the DOJ study is one that's most commonly used probably across the nation. It's a per capita study. It's based solely off population, nothing more. Um, if you go by our current population, so this, this breaks down also into regions and to uh, department size based off population. And so if you go by our current population, it's roughly 1.89 officers per 1,000 is what they recommend. If you go to then the south, that's a national recommendation. If you go to the south region where we actually fall, it's actually 2.3 officers per thousand. If you use the population uh, that was in part of our budget documents, which was the 25,312, uh, that officer per thousand actually drops slightly to 2.1 per thousand for the south, or the 1.7 officers per thousand um, nationally. And again, that, that's still an increase of anywhere from three to 12 officers over what we stand right now. Uh, our recommendation on that is, is a six officer increase. It's below the DOJ standard for the south region, uh, but it is above the average that came out of the IACP study that also included in that packet. That packet, or that study rather, is done basically off of calls for service. And so what it doesn't attribute to is anything outside of the street. So it's calls for service only. It doesn't address the chief, the assistant chief, any of your administrative positions, investigators, traffic, um, canine, your SROs, any of that. So all those positions are added on to that survey or that, that study because uh, it just counts officers to respond to the actual calls for service you have. Based on that study, we're looking at about 44 officers. Again, it's a free officer increase over where we are now. Uh, what that study does not cover, though, is it doesn't cover the increases you see in violent crime that are occurring across the nation. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen a couple of those here in the, in the recent past uh, with some shootings here in our city. Uh, you know, we can anticipate when those are gonna occur, but it's not a 45 minute call solution when that happens. Uh, that's part of that IACP study that you have in your packet. Um, when we have those calls, it's not a one officer 45 minutes, it's all hands on deck for an hour and a half, two hours, maybe three hours, depending on the call type. So it doesn't, calculate for those types of, of calls, nor does it uh, consider the increase in domestics, which are also very time intensive, or the emotionally disturbed person calls, which uh, Robin kind of touched on with, with the diversion program. Uh, but we're seeing you know, a, a substantial increase in those type of calls. And, and again, it comes back to the COVID regulations and you lock people at home and things of that nature, they, they have some mental issues that, that start to arise. So we've seen that you know across the nation. We've seen it in our own on backyard here so uh, looking at those studies I mean again our recommendation is is a six officer increase it's below that of the DOJ standard it's above that of the IACP standard but I think we can show uh, the reason for that and, and why that would be necessary um, and with that I'll take any questions you might have so would uh, I, I know that I sent you an email on the uh, school thing so would the, the officers that's currently doing the school, would that feel part of this six or would it be above and beyond that? I think it's two. We have three SROs in, uh, currently. And um, I, we ha we have had some discussions obviously about what we do with those, those positions uh, and when they might come available. So if in fact uh, MSISD creates their own police department, It'll probably be, you know, a year or so down the road before they were up and running and replace those people, but they would come back to our, to patrol our positions. So yes, it, those three positions could be included in this plan to add Correct. six. Yes. Are they included in that 41 right now? They are part of the yes. 41 count. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's a good point because we don't have them really to utilize on the street. 24 7. That's okay. I just was wondering if it's, they're included. So, this is the six is above and beyond that. Okay. And we already have planned to hire two in the in the spring, right? And that's on our list for the two officers in March ish or so. 
we've talked about two positions. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say that it's two patrol positions okay. or two right. unsworn, but two positions mm -hmm. at this one, yes. So if you got the six taken from the Walker Street Walk, what they would do and how it would protect the citizens, well, so what would they see immediately? What would that so part of what you'd see uh, right off the bat is quicker response times. Um, that's what everybody's looking for. You know, when you need a cop, you can't find one. It's uh, trying to get them there as quick as possible. Um, increase our city division from probably the four districts it has now to a fifth district. So you, you, you decrease the size of the patrol area for the officers, which allows for that increase in, in response time or decrease in response time, but uh, increase in, in visibility, if you will. Um, there is nothing that says, you know, police being visible actually deters crime or how much crime it deters. It's a known fact that when you take officers off the street and, and make them invisible, the crime goes up. It's, uh, there is no study that I can point you to that says, well, one additional officer on the street equates to any percentage of decrease in crime. It's, uh, we know that it happens, but you can't measure it because I can't measure what doesn't occur. So uh, what I can tell you is when you reduce those numbers, crime does go up, and we see that across the nation with the defund the police movement. So um, we're trying to circumvent that. I know the citizens, it definitely makes them feel better. They know when the police are cruising through their neighborhood. So and and right now, our, our surveys that the city has done uh, as part of the, the improvements in, in communities and all, uh, I think Henry Horn did one of the, the surveys. And, and law enforcement or public safety was one of their top concerns yeah. uh, in three different areas. Well, two of those areas were positive, mm -hmm. that we had a good police force, we had good public safety, including fire. Um, so that was things that they were thankful for in the community. The one category where it wasn't a positive was the increase in crime that they feel that, that may be occurring uh, currently. And so uh, the, the way you address that, unfortunately, is costly because it oftentimes involves personnel and throwing personnel at it. So. These officers were looking at, uh, you said hiring in March, I believe you said. Yeah, I was gonna ask the chief about that. Is that what, or Gabe, that's what's on our, our current plan? Uh, do we have the equipment for them, the cars? Yeah, I mean, we do. Yes. Okay. Um, the way the way our vehicles operate is they're on on the road for twelve hours at a time, and they take a twelve hour break. And so, uh, trying to keep from running twenty four seven. I came from an agency that did that. You couldn't keep a car running. Uh, you start riding two officers to a car because you don't you have no vehicles that are up and operational. Um, our vehicles run for twelve hours at a time on a opposing shifts so that way uh, it always gets 12 hours of rest before it's driven again unless another vehicle's out and it has to be utilized so we do have those vehicles available with our current current staffing that's in place uh, there are units that may set out for the 24 you know, for a 24 hour period while someone's actually off shift because it doesn't have anybody on the opposing shift to drive it so we do have the vehicles currently in, in staff to, to accommodate at least those two positions so if we were able to approve the six officers, what is the staffing issues that we're looking at? Recruiting issues, I should say. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it, we probably would have some difficulty taking on six at one time, um, you, but it's possible to do it. The Our applicant pool, and I, I presented something to, to the council um, last year in an update about ap the applicant pool and law enforcement generally, but it's down, just to, to cut it to the quick, it's down nationally about 70% or more. We, we've done, we've checked the stats for our local um, applicants and uh, we're down probably about 50 to 55% from what we were five years ago. Um, the biggest issue with that reduction in the total applicants is that we are way down in qualified certified applicants. So in other words, we had always relied here in Saginaw on hiring police officers that were already certified, already been through an academy and probably worked somewhere else before they came here. And, and that cuts down considerably on the hiring time and training time. So what we've had to do for about the last year is sponsor people as uh, police recruits and send them to TCC Academy and train them up. So you can add about a year, 
time from the time that we process their application and find a qualified applicant to send them to the the, the uh, required state training and then put them through field training and get them on the street as a as a patrol officer so um, then also we have to consider the capacity that we have to actually train people in the field which um, you know so I you know I think realistically we would probably need to phase those six positions in over a period of time in order to adequately get that done and again three of them could be the SRO positions um, and we'd probably save those for for later if in fact EMS uh, ISD does create their own police department again like I said that's at least probably a year down the road before our SROs would be replaced by them so um, we're facing a few issues in getting that done but if I also could just take a moment to, to add to your question councilman about uh, what it would mean to the citizens so for for those of you especially that probably went to, that went to some of the garage gabs and 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 also hear some of the complaints that we get um, just randomly our number one complaint in, from citizens is traffic enforcement well one of the things that we've had to kind of cut back on uh, in manpower deployment is a dedicated traffic enforcement officer just to keep the shifts uh, set up to to uh, to be able to respond adequately 24 7 now that doesn't mean that we so uh, I'll back up on that just a second though and I'll tell you that we're gonna probably set a record this year for the number of traffic contacts that we've made it'll be over 8,000 and we'll probably set a record for the number of citations that we've issued in one year this year um, so we're out there working traffic and writing a lot of tickets but we could write twice that many tickets if we had the manpower to do it and I think you know that could significantly make an issue in the in um, the, the perception of the citizens on the safety of their neighborhoods in terms of you know the tr traffic uh, flow through the neighborhoods and second to that we have also um, we, we pulled, like Russell said, we pulled the position back that was a supervisor position over the civilian operations. We replaced that with a civilian position, uh, a little bit less um, uh, cost factor there, uh, but actually um, better for the whole operation because it's somebody that grew up in that system and knows it better than the police officer does. So I think we're maximizing the resources there. We've also held back on uh, filling a detective investigator position uh, over the last couple of years that we desperately need as well so uh, and that's affected the processing of some of the, the offense reports and some reports that we've taken it's slowed down that process and it's actually cut down a little bit on the number of cases that we filed so um, we you know given all of that we could we could if we could find six certified peace officers next week we could hire them and put them on the street and put them to work and make a significant difference realistically we probably can't do that for a, for a while um, because of what I explained earlier but but you know we're we're, we're giving you we're, we're just trying kind of trying to give you the best numbers and and facts that we can might also mention that um, we're we're engaging we've engaged in some conversations with the uh, uh, Lake Worth about um, some some partnerships with them that have helped us out but on our dispatching side which is really critical we, we've recently uh, obtained some data from from Tarrant County 911 and had that analyzed and their assessment by the standards that they go by shows that we could use three dispatchers on duty at times and and no and a minimum of two so and that's just to answer the phone calls and keep afloat the the operation of assessing and processing those calls and dispatching officers out so we we typically now right now are operating with one 
with a second one during peak times that we bring in. Uh, we've also, but we, I'll, I'll mention too that we, we've borrowed a dispatcher part-time from Lake Worth and we get her to come in and fill in. Um, we've, and we've experienced due to either, well due mainly to COVID issues, but also some other issues, we've experienced that number of six permanent full-time positions dropping to as low as three twice now in the past year. So when that happens, we're in real dire critical straits, and we've had to make do with what we can, pull people off patrol and other places who have dispatching experience and put them in the communication center. So, um, And actually for four days, we dropped to two, so trying to cover four shifts with two people. Yeah, so just, that's, just to give you the full picture, uh, I think that's something that's in your consideration. It seems like the dispatching is the most critical. Yes, sir. It, yeah. it is the if we if we had uh, like the slides Gabe was showing Gabe was showing with uh, the other departments up there with the immediate need that would be the number one. And you absolutely. In and order to and get I can clarify some of that as well. So we have one dispatcher that's been out for almost a year um, due to COVID complications. She was out from December to September full time. She came back in September working a modified shift. She works there 32 hours a week, an eight-hour shift, and she's maxed out, and that's her uh, doctor's release is the max she can work. I have a second dispatcher that is in college doing an internship. She's fixing to go to part-time in December the 28th. So my five dispatchers goes to realistically three dispatchers um, trying to cover four shifts. So it, it is in dire straits. It's, as we speak right now as far as the, the staffing there now. Well, and the assessment you had done paints that as that. That's why that's one of the findings you got, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Are there any other questions from Chief? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so if a citizen calls 911 mm -hmm. from their home or from their cell phone, does it go to you or does it go to Fort Worth? It goes to us. It goes to us, okay. So the dispatch or the 911 system is actually set up to where the towers have sectors in them, and those sectors are based off the zip code or the agency that would have the primary jurisdiction of that sector, and that's where it goes. So we'll occasionally get a, a 911 call that needs to go to Fort Worth. Occasionally they'll get one that needs to come to us, but in, in bulk everything goes where it's supposed to go with the, with the programming that they have in place. Are there any questions for Chief Ragsdale? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, so, so as council, what, what do we do to fix this? Yeah. We'll, we'll go ahead, Gabe. Yeah, just a couple more slides on library, and then our last slide is what we're recommending mid-year. So uh, one thing I want to add in, as is every budget year, we have to balance um, – cost of living and market-based adjustments, as well as we're coming off the second year of a rate guarantee for uh, health insurance. I promise you we'll have some increase uh, and we'll have to either make plan changes or absorb costs. Uh, if we pass that down to employees, that has the net effect of a pay cut. So these are all things we have to balance. Um, just to run through library, of course, everybody's excited about the new uh, library. You just approved the construction manager, so uh, excited to get them on board. So these are future positions in a new facility, uh, circulation manager full-time, a dedicated children's assistant, and uh, part-time adult learning. Anything to add, Ellen? Okay, I'll go to the next one. Yeah, maybe just have Ellen describe. As you know, we're moving to a building that's three times the size of the library we have, so that is going to need more staff to run it, and we're hoping to increase our programs and services to, um, you know, really fill that new, new building with fun stuff. So <laughs> we need people to do that. Uh, the previous slide was the 2023 requests, and these are the 2024. Um, talking with Gabe, we just decided it, you know, it's probably better if we spread this over multiple budget years as opposed to getting all the new staff you know, when we open the building. So um, on the previous slide were the three um, 
positions that we could really use now. Um, we, um, you know, run a lot of programs, we do a lot of stuff, and these are all positions that would help us, you know, where we are right now and as we build towards the new building. So um, those are kind of the, the ones that we could accommodate in our, that we could try to accommodate in our staff area right now and um, would really help us with our current programs. And then these are ones that um, would be better to hire, you know, as we move. Um, so that's, uh, those are all listed there and I don't think you want me to go through all of them, but if you have any questions, I can answer it. Oh, and then this, this third slide is looking towards the future. So after we move, this is 2025 plus. Um, these are just other positions that would fill out our staff structure and give us, you know, good coverage in all of our different areas. So I can answer any questions you have. Yeah. <laughs> of course, we're several years out from moving into the new library, but yeah. how long does it take you to ramp up new programs that you're going to be trying to put out well there. that depends on what it is um, you know some days we have great ideas and we start planning right away and you know we can implement it the next month or something you know like that um, we've done that with a lot of a lot of different stuff some of our craft programs have happened that way and stuff like that so there's that and then there's stuff that we take a long time to uh, to plan out and and implement so it really depends on what the program is We go back to 2023, the, the first library request. So those three positions, if you had to pick one, which one would it be? <laughs> well, that's too hard. <laughs> um, all three of these are really um, needs that we have right now. The circulation manager um, would be a full-time position where right now we have four part-time positions that man our front desk. So mm -hmm. that's really our public face. Those are really important positions, mm -hmm. but they're all part-time. So if we had a full-time uh, manager, that's, that's a, somebody that would still work at the desk, but would it be able to um, cover training for all of those, cover shifts when people are out, that kind of stuff. So that would be really important. Um, and with all of these, we wanna promote from within as much as we mm. can. You know, we've got really good people there. You know, you know we have good people. Sure. <laughs> um, the children's assistant is also something we could desperately need right now. Um, we're building back our outreach program after COVID, um, going out to daycares, as Valerie knows. <laughs> um, getting, um, you know, really interacting with all those, you know, really small children, the, um, the, uh, the youngest citizens, um, so, and, and teaching them good library skills. So that's um, something we always need people for right now. We have two children's librarians and they do that together, but if we had a third person to assist them, we can just build, you know, even better children's programs, children's and teens programs. And heaven forbid somebody gets sick. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. That's always something, yeah. If, if one of them has to go and do story time for a huge, you know, class of mm -hmm. small children, you know, that, that's hard. <laughs> so that would really help um, with, you know, with children's programs for all ages. Um, and then the adult learning assistant, y'all have heard Ronnie come and talk about our mm -hmm. English language classes, citizenship, GED. He can always use help with that. So um, it would be really hard to pick one among these, mm -hmm. I guess, the children's assistant might be my top priority, mm -hmm. but um, all three of them. I understand. Important. Appreciate that. Any other questions for Ellen? Thank you very much. So, Mayor and Council, just to summarize uh, what we will request um, mid year, I think will be two positions to be determined uh, for PD uh, and then a rental inspector, which again, we have a dedicated. Um, funding source partial offset to fund that position so I uh, just want to close with uh, these are these are challenges that are um, comparatively nice to have so we're in a very desirable community that's growing and you know the growing pains um, are experienced by all cities that have more people that want to be here so happy to answer any questions you might have and this will be something we bring back to you in the future any questions for Gabe the one thing I'd like to remind folks, council and staff as well, not everybody's going to get what they want. Uh, we can't afford, you know, we are, uh, we have limited resources. We have resources, we have limited resources. So looking at these numbers, that's why I was asking the hard questions is what's your priority and what's your top priority? And we can accommodate some of those, but not all. And we will plan it out over years, uh, not all at once, but that's, 
it's good to get this and start thinking about these things before we have to make these hard decisions. And I appreciate staff putting this together. So this gets us sort of a, a guidepost for where we are down the road, what we need to be and what we need short term and long term. So thank you. I think something that would help us make those decisions is to see numbers. You know, mm -hmm. how many people are coming to the libraries? How many are the kids programs? How many adult programs? Uh, obviously, you know, we get on our monthly reports, you know, data, real data from the police and fire, um, you know, uh, the senior citizen center. I'd like mm -hmm. to see some good hard numbers from that. How many people show up each day? I know when uh, PGAL was here, they did an analysis on what time of day do you come here? And it looks like most of that, uh, the majority of the people show up in the morning and very few people show up in the afternoons. So those are things that are gonna be really important to help us make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Some hard data. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, great idea. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I would like to say, and go back to this uh, call center thing. I mean, when you're short staffed like that, and there's definitely, there's been an independent assessment that says we have a problem. And you stress people out, and you, you got it two ways. So one, if you're working people really hard and they're understaffed, they, they get short nerve. Then you start getting people calling in to the center that's, you know, that may be having a problem that's, you, you can end up w with a problem there. And also too, when people call that, call these numbers, they need help. So, so to me, th this is something we probably need to look at. You know, I really don't know if this is a like to have or not, or a need to have. Mm -hmm. What kind of training is required for dispatch? Um, you know, the, the training that I described for, to get a police officer on the street, it's not too far from that. Um, it's so specialized that when, it, especially taking somebody that's never had any experience, um, it takes um, probably at least about six months mm -hmm. to get them to where they're up to speed to operate by themselves. If we can, again, if we find somebody that is, um, has experience, that could be cut down to two or three months. Okay. All right, thank you, thank you, staff. Appreciate that. Appreciate the information. Um, if you want to speak on this subject about about the staffing, sure, absolutely. Come on. Um, I'm Robert Dixon. I actually live in North Carolina, 1003 Catherine Avenue, Kinston, North Carolina. Um, but I work in this area frequently, and I pass through Saginaw, this beautiful city. Um, throughout the year and I have a real passion for public safety I love public safety I love great public safety and I hate bad public safety um, I probably call 911 more than anyone else in North Texas um, my experience here just a couple nights ago was ridiculous it's one that I've never experienced before. Um, it was approximately 12.30 a.m. I'm traveling down Longhorn. You know, I'm wanting to make a turn onto Saginaw Boulevard. And, um, but as I'm approaching the traffic light, I notice that the two vehicles in front of me violate the traffic light. They, this red, they violate it. So I'm suspecting that there's a problem. Maybe it's not functioning right or something. So, as I proceeded to the, to the uh, to, excuse me, as I assumed my position there on the front line, um, I'm sitting there just giving it some time because I don't want a traffic citation. I don't want an officer to cite me for running a red light. So I'm gonna give it some time and allow the lights to cycle through a couple, let's say a couple of times or so. And once I realized that I was not going to get a green light, then I made my turn. I looked and tried to use my judgment as best I could. And there was very little traffic that time of the night. So uh, it wasn't hard, it wasn't a hard decision. But I was still kind of wondering, gee, is there an officer sitting here gonna see me and you know really be upset about this? Because it's unsafe to violate uh, traffic laws. So um, basically I, I called 911. 
I've done that probably a hundred times for a signal light malfunction. Typically, these cities throughout North Texas greatly appreciate a citizen that would volunteer his or her time to let them know that this traffic light that's they're being relied upon for law and order, it's being relied upon for safety of the, of the uh, traffic flow, uh, vehicles moving through that intersection, uh, they appreciate that and they never complain and they never lecture me or never say, oh, you're abusing the 911 system for calling in a, a, a signal light malfunction. No one ever, ever does that, Mayor. They never do that. Uh, they really appreciate that call because that gives them a chance to take decisive action. They can contact their patrol officer or sergeant, supervisor, whatever, uh, and, and let them know, hey, this light's not working properly. Um, and then they can perhaps contact Public Works or TxDOT or whoever it might be that's controlling the, uh, the equipment there. And so, um, you know, they, they just never, uh, you know, they, they're, they're appreciative of that, you know, and typically it's a short call because typically what happens is they want to know, well, what's happening there? And I'll say, well, it's maybe flashing red in all directions or whatever. Okay, and uh, they just take it from there and they just move on. But, uh, but what happened to me was ridiculous because the, the lady that I spoke with, she said, uh, you need to call TxDOT. You need to call TxDOT, okay? Don't call 911. You know, this is, you know, this is a public safety issue. Um, so call TxDOT, okay? Don't call us. And, and you're abusing the 911 system. You know, you shouldn't be calling 911 for this. And so it was like, gee whiz, uh, this is ridiculous. And I just didn't expect that. I'd never had it happen before. And so basically at that point, I said something short, something sarcastic, you know, and just ended the call. But then I bowled a little bit and I called back on the non-emergency line and I asked to speak to a supervisor or the watch commander, the lieutenant, the administrative officer on duty. Well, there wasn't one. There was a sergeant. It was Sergeant, uh, I forget the name now, but... Uh, um, so I, I got really, I will to apologize to the city, by the way, because I lost control of my tongue. I should not have done that. Uh, that's not right. It's not right at any point in time. I apologize. Um, I, I was very arrogant towards the, uh, the dispatcher, and I just, uh, it was insulting, and, and I, 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 I just crossed the line there. And I, there's no reason for that, no excuse for that, and I'm very sorry. But uh, I, I guess the point I would make is that I'm hoping that improvements can be made so that persons like myself who are, are calling in something that is a real concern, that is something that would, uh, that, that is a public safety hazard or, you know, there's a, you know, a problem there that is endangering lives and property. In other words, if somebody goes through that light and they hit another car, well, then you've got, di you're dispatching fire, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, if, uh, in, you know, you can just imagine where that can go from there. But, um, but anyway, I just wanted to share these things with you, and I appreciate you giving me this time. And I saw your email, and I, I think we spoke, and I wanted to just hear what the, the chief's response to this would be, and I think we've talked about it a little bit, but go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, yeah we've, uh, I wasn't able to get the briefing on it today, but we have, uh, had our supervisor and communications uh, investigate that. The, the dispatcher probably was incorrect um, in, in uh, telling him to call TxDOT because of the boulevard and Longhorn, when that light turns solid red and stays that way, it's generally a railroad issue, um, and we have to call the railroad, um, which that happens pretty frequently with that, that light just locks up solid red. Um, so, but we're investigating that, and uh, I'll be glad to get back with you via email or phone or in person, however, and let you know the outcome of that. Thanks, Chief. Right. I, I just want to make a, if I can make a difference, you know, that's oh, what I'm Thank you, Mr. About. Dixon. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Right, so that is item number 16. Item number 17, executive session is not, not required, thankfully. So item 18, adjournment. I will entertain a motion. Yeah, I make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Charlie, second. Valerie, sec Charlie made the motion. Charlie, second. You got that, Janice? <laughs> all those in favor say aye. At 9.04, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much.